Part 1. March, 1820. London, England. Chapter 1. I wouldn't call it a jolly good time, but it's not as bad as that. There are women, after all, and where there are women, I'm bound to make merry. From Michael Sterling to his cousin, John, the Earl of Kilmartin. Posted from the 52nd Foot Guards during the Napoleonic Wars. In every life there is a turning point. A moment so tremendous, so sharp and clear, that one feels as if one's been hit in the chest, all the breath knocked out, and one knows, absolutely knows, without the merest hint of a shadow of a doubt, that one's life will never be the same. For Michael Sterling, that moment came the first time he laid eyes on Francesca Bridgerton. After a lifetime of chasing women, of smiling slyly as they chased him, of allowing himself to be caught, and then turning the tables until he was the victor, of caressing and kissing and making love to them, but never actually allowing his heart to become engaged, he took one look at Francesca Bridgerton and fell so fast and so hard into love, it was a wonder he managed to remain standing. Unfortunately for Michael, however, Francesca's surname was to remain Bridgerton a mere thirty-six hours longer. The occasion of their meeting was, lamentably, a supper celebrating her imminent wedding to his cousin. Life was ironic that way, Michael liked to think, in his more polite moods. In his less polite moods, he used a different adjective entirely. And his moods, since falling in love with his first cousin's wife, were not often polite. Oh, he hid it well. It wouldn't do to be visibly out of sorts. Then some annoyingly perceptive soul might actually take notice, and, God forbid, inquire as to his welfare. And while Michael Sterling held a not unsubstantiated pride in his ability to dissemble and deceive, he had, after all, seduced more women than anyone cared to count, and had somehow managed to do it all without ever once being challenged to a duel. Well, the sodding truth of it was that he'd never been in love before, and if ever there was a time that a man might lose his ability to maintain a façade under direct questioning, this was probably it. And so he laughed, and was very merry, and he continued to seduce women— trying not to notice that he tended to close his eyes when he had them in bed, and he stopped going to church entirely, because there seemed no point now in even contemplating prayer for his soul. Besides, the parish church near Kilmartin dated to 1432, and the crumbling stones certainly couldn't take a direct strike of lightning. And if God ever wanted to smite a sinner, he couldn't do better than Michael Sterling. Michael Sterling sinner. He could see it on a calling card. He'd have had it printed up even. His was just that sort of black sense of humour. If he weren't convinced, it would kill his mother on the spot. Rake he might be, but there was no need to torture the woman who'd borne him. Funny how he'd never seen all those other women as a sin. He still didn't. They'd all been willing, of course. You couldn't seduce an unwilling woman— at least not if you took seduction at the true sense of the word and took care not to confuse it with rape. They had to actually want it, and if they didn't, if Michael sensed even a hint of unease, he turned and walked away. His passions were never so out of control that he couldn't manage a quick and decisive departure. And besides, he'd never seduced a virgin, and he'd never slept with a married woman. Oh, very well. One ought to remain true to oneself, even while living a lie. He'd slept with married women, plenty of them, but only the ones whose husbands were rotters, and even then, not unless she'd already produced two male offspring. Three, if one of the boys seemed a little sickly. A man had to have rules of conduct, after all. But this, this was beyond the pale entirely unacceptable. This was the one transgression, and he'd had many, that was finally going to blacken his soul, or at the very least, and this was assuming he maintained the strength never to act upon his desires, make it a rather deep shade of charcoal.
because this, this. He coveted his cousin's wife. He coveted John's wife. John. John, who, damn it all, was more of a brother to him than one of his own could ever have been. John, whose family had taken him in when his father had died. John, whose father had raised him and taught him to be a man. John, with whom, oh, bloody hell, did he really need to do this to himself? He could spend a senite cataloguing all the reasons why he was going straight to hell for having chosen John's wife with whom to fall in love, and none of it was ever going to change one simple fact. He couldn't have her. He could never have Francesca Bridgerton Sterling. But, he thought with a snort, as he slouched into the sofa and propped his ankle over his knee, watching them across their drawing-room, laughing and smiling, and making nauseating eyes at each other, he could have another drink. "'I think I will,' he announced, downing it in one gulp. "'What was that, Michael?' John asked, his hearing superb, as always, damn it. Michael produced an excellent forgery of a smile and lifted his glass aloft. "'Just thirsty,' he said, maintaining the perfect picture of a bon vivant. They were at Kilmartin House, in London, as opposed to Kilmartin, no house, no castle, just Kilmartin, up in Scotland, where the boys had grown up, or the other Kilmartin House in Edinburgh. Not a creative soul among his forebears, Michael had often reflected. There was also a Kilmartin cottage, if one could call twenty-two rooms a cottage, Kilmartin Abbey, and, of course, Kilmartin Hall. Michael had no idea why no one had thought to offer their surname to one of the residences. Stirling House had a perfectly respectful ring to it, in his opinion. He supposed that the ambitious and unimaginative Stirlings of old had been so damned besotted with their newfound earldom that they couldn't think to put any other name on anything. He snorted into his glass of whisky. It was a wonder he didn't drink Kilmartin tea and sit on a Kilmartin-style chair. In fact, he probably would be doing just that if his grandmother had found a way to manage it without actually taking the family into trade. The old Martinet had been so proud, one would have thought she'd been born a Sterling, rather than simply married into the name. As far as she'd been concerned, the Countess of Kilmartin herself, was just as important as any loftier personage, and she'd more than once sniffed her displeasure when being led into supper after an upstart marchioness or duchess. The Queen, Michael thought dispassionately. He supposed his grandmother had knelt before the Queen, but he certainly couldn't imagine her offering deference to any other female. She would have approved of Francesca Bridgerton. Grandmother Sterling would surely have turned her nose up upon learning that Francesca's father was a mere viscount, but the Bridgertons were an old and immensely popular, and, when the fancy took them, powerful family. Plus, Francesca's spine was straight, and her manner was proud, and her sense of humour was sly and subversive. If she'd been fifty years older, and not nearly so attractive— she would have made quite a fine companion for Grandmother Sterling. And now Francesca was the Countess of Kilmartin, married to his cousin John, who was one year his junior, but in the Sterling household always treated with the deference due the elder. He was the heir, after all. Their fathers had been twins, but John's had entered the world seven minutes before Michael's. The most critical seven minutes in Michael Sterling's life and he hadn't even been alive for them. "'What shall we do for our second anniversary?' Francesca asked, as she crossed the room and seated herself at the pianoforte. "'Whatever you want,' John answered. Francesca turned to Michael, her eyes startlingly blue, even in the candlelight. Or maybe it was just that he knew how blue they were. He seemed to dream in blue these days. Francesca blue the colour ought to be called. Michael, she said, her tone indicating that the word was a repetition. Sorry, he said, offering her the lopsided smile he so frequently affixed to his face. 
No one ever took him seriously when he smiled like that, which was, of course, the point. Wasn't listening. Do you have any ideas? she asked. For what? For our anniversary. If she'd had an arrow, she couldn't have jammed it into his heart any harder. But he just shrugged, since he was appallingly good at faking it. It's not my anniversary, he reminded her. I know, she said. He wasn't looking at her, but she sounded like she rolled her eyes. But she hadn't. Michael was certain of that. He'd come to know Francesca agonizingly well in the past two years, and he knew she didn't roll her eyes. When she was feeling sarcastic, or ironic, or sly, it was all there in her voice and the curious tip of her mouth. She didn't need to roll her eyes. She just looked at you with that direct stare, her lips curving ever so slightly, and... Michael swallowed reflexively, then covered it with a sip of his drink. It didn't really speak well of him that he'd spent so much time analysing the curve of his cousin's wife's lips. I assure you, Francesca continued, idly trailing the pads of her fingertips along the surface of the piano keys without actually pressing any into sound, I'm well aware of whom I married. I'm sure you are, he muttered. Beg pardon? Continue, he said. Her lips pursed in a peevish crease. He'd seen her with that expression quite frequently, usually in her dealings with her brothers. I was asking your advice, she said, because you are so often merry. I'm so often merry, he repeated, knowing that was how the world saw him. They called him the Merry Rake, after all, but hating the word on her lips. It made him feel frivolous, without substance. And then he felt even worse, because it was probably true. You disagree? she inquired. Of course not, he murmured. I'm simply unused to being asked for advice regarding anniversary celebrations, as it is clear I have no talent for marriage. That's not clear at all, she said. You're in for it now, John said with a chuckle, settling back in his seat with that morning's copy of the Times. You have never tried marriage, Francesca pointed out. How could you possibly know you have no talent for it? Michael managed a smirk. I think it's fairly clear to all who know me. Besides, what need have I? I have no title. No property. You have property, John interjected, demonstrating that he was still listening from behind his newspaper. Only a small bit of property, Michael corrected, which I am more than happy to leave for your children, since it was given to me by John anyway. Francesca looked at her husband, and Michael knew exactly what she was thinking. That John had given him the property because John wanted him to feel he had something a purpose, really. Michael had been at loose ends since decommissioning from the army several years back, and although John had never said so, Michael knew that he felt guilty for having not fought for England on the continent, for remaining behind while Michael faced danger alone. But John had been heir to an earldom. He had a duty to marry, be fruitful, and multiply. No one had expected him to go to war. Michael had often wondered if the property, a rather lovely and comfortable manor house with twenty acres, was John's form of penance, and he rather suspected that Francesca wondered the same. But she would never ask. Francesca understood men with remarkable clarity, probably from growing up with all of those brothers. Francesca knew exactly what not to ask a man, which always left Michael a little worried. He thought he hid his feelings well, but what if she knew? She would never speak of it, of course, never even allude to it. He rather suspected they were, ironically, alike that way. If Francesca suspected he was in love with her, she would never alter her manner in any way. I think you should go to Kilmartin, Michael said abruptly. To Scotland? Francesca asked, pressing gently against B-flat on the pianoforte. With the season so close. Michael stood, 
suddenly rather eager to depart. He shouldn't have come over in any case. Why not? he asked, his tone careless. You love it there. John loves it there. It's not such a long journey if your carriage is well sprung. Will you come? John asked. I think not, Michael said sharply, as if he cared to witness their anniversary celebration. Truly, all it would do was remind him of what he could never have, which would then remind him of the guilt, or amplify it. Reminders were rather unnecessary. He lived with it every day. Thou shalt not covet thy cousin's wife. Moses must have forgotten to write that one down. I have much to do here, Michael said. You do? Francesca asked, her eyes lighting with interest. What? Oh, you know, he said wryly, all those things I have to do to prepare for a life of dissolution and aimlessness. Francesca stood. Oh, God! She stood, and she was walking to him. This was the worst, when she actually touched him. She laid her hand on his upper arm. Michael did his best not to flinch. I wish you wouldn't speak that way, she said. Michael looked past her shoulder to John, who had raised his newspaper just high enough so that he could pretend he wasn't listening. Am I to become your project, then? Michael asked, a bit unkindly. She drew back. We care about you. We. We. Not I. Not John. We. A subtle reminder that they were a unit. John and Francesca. Lord and Lady Kilmartin. She hadn't meant it that way, of course, but it was how he heard it all the same. And I care for you, Michael said, waiting for a plague of locusts to stream through the room. I know, she said, oblivious to his distress. I could never ask for a better cousin, but I want you to be happy. Michael glanced over at John, giving him a look that clearly said, Save me. John gave up his pretense of reading and set the paper down. Francesca, darling, Michael is a grown man. He'll find his happiness as he sees fit, when he sees fit. Francesca's lips pursed, and Michael could tell she was irritated. She didn't like to be thwarted, and she certainly did not enjoy admitting that she might not be able to arrange her world and the people inhabiting it to her satisfaction. I should introduce you to my sister, she said. Good God! I've met your sister, Michael said quickly. All of them, in fact. Even the one still in leading strings. She's not in. She cut herself off, grinding her teeth together. I grant you that Hyacinth is not suitable, but Eloise is... I'm not marrying Eloise, Michael said sharply. I didn't say you had to marry her, Francesca said. Just dance with her once or twice. I've done so, he reminded her, and that is all I am going to do. But... Francesca, John said. His voice was gentle, but his meaning was clear. Stop. Michael could have kissed him for his interference. John, of course, just thought that he was saving his cousin from needless feminine nagging. There was no way he could know the truth that Michael was trying to compute the level of guilt one might feel for being in love with one's cousin's wife and one's wife's sister. Good God! Married to Eloise Bridgerton? Was Francesca trying to kill him? We should all go for a walk, Francesca said suddenly. Michael glanced out the window. All vestiges of daylight had left the sky. Isn't it a bit late for that? he asked. Not with two strong men as escorts, she said. And besides, the streets in Mayfair are well lit. We shall be perfectly safe. She turned to her husband. What do you say, darling? I have an appointment this evening, John said, consulting his pocket watch. But you should go with Michael. More proof that John had no idea of Michael's feelings. The two of you will always have such a fine time together, John added. Francesca turned to Michael and smiled, worming her way another inch into his heart. Will you? she asked. 
I'm desperate for a spot of fresh air, now that the rain has stopped, and I've been feeling rather odd all day, I must say. Of course, Michael replied, since they all knew that he had no appointments. His was a life of carefully cultivated dissolution. Besides, he couldn't resist her. He knew he should stay away, knew he should never allow himself to be alone in her company. He would never act upon his desires, but truly, did he really need to subject himself to this sort of agony? He'd just end the day alone in bed, racked by guilt and desire in almost equal measures. But when she smiled at him, he couldn't say no, and he certainly wasn't strong enough to deny himself an hour in her presence because her presence was all he was ever going to get. There would never be a kiss, never a meaningful glance or touch. There would be no whispered words of love, no moans of passion. All he could have was her smile and her company, and, pathetic idiot that he was, he was willing to take it. "'Just give me a moment,' she said, pausing in the doorway. "'I need to get my coat. "'Be quick about it.' John said. It's already after seven. I'll be safe enough with Michael to protect me, she said with a jaunty smile. But don't worry, I'll be quick. And then she offered her husband a wicked smile. I'm always quick. Michael averted his eyes as his cousin actually blushed. Lord above, but he truly did not want to know the meaning behind I'll be quick. Unfortunately, it could have been any number of things, all of them deliciously sexual, and he was likely to spend the next hour cataloguing them all in his mind, imagining them being done to him. He tugged at his cravat. Maybe he could get out of this jaunt with Francesca. Maybe he could go home and draw a cold bath, or better yet, find himself a willing woman with long chestnut hair. And if he was lucky blue eyes as well. I'm sorry about that, John said, once Francesca had left. Michael's eyes flew to his face. Surely John would never mention Francesca's innuendo. Her nagging, John added. You're young enough. You don't need to be married yet. You're younger than I, Michael said, mostly to be contrary. Yes, but I met Francesca. John shrugged helplessly, as if that ought to be explanation enough. And of course it was. I don't mind her nagging, Michael said. Of course you do. I can see it in your eyes. And that was the problem. John could see it in his eyes. There was no one in the world who knew him better. If something was bothering him, John would always be able to tell. The miracle was that John didn't realise why Michael was distressed. I will tell her to leave you alone, John said, although you should know that she only nags because she loves you. Michael managed a tight smile. He certainly couldn't manage words. Thank you for taking her for a walk, John said, standing up. She's been a bit peckish all day, with the rain. Said she's been feeling uncommonly closed in. When is your appointment? Michael asked. Nine o'clock, John replied, as they walked out into the hall. I'm meeting Lord Liverpool. Parliamentary business? John nodded. He took his position in the House of Lords very seriously. Michael had often wondered if he'd have approached the duty with as much gravity had he been born a lord. Probably not. But then again, it didn't much matter, did it? Michael watched as John rubbed his left temple. Are you all right? he asked. You look a little... He didn't finish the sentence, since he wasn't quite certain how John looked. Not right. That was all he knew. And he knew John, inside and out, probably better than Francesca did. Devil of a headache, John muttered. I've had it all day. Do you want me to call for some laudanum? John shook his head. Hate the stuff. It makes my mind fuzzy, and I need my wits about me for the meeting with Liverpool. Michael nodded. You look pale, he said. Why, he didn't know. It wasn't as if it was going to change John's mind about the laudanum. 
Do I? John asked, wincing as he pressed his fingers harder into the skin of his temple. I think I'll lie down if you don't mind. I don't need to leave for an hour. Right, Michael murmured. Do you want me to have someone wake you? John shook his head. I'll ask my valet myself. Just then, Francesca descended the stairs, wrapped in a long velvet cloak of midnight blue. Good evening, gentlemen, she said, clearly basking in the undivided male attention. But as she reached the bottom, she frowned. Is something wrong, darling? she asked John. Just a headache, John said. It's nothing. You should lie down, she said. John managed a smile. I'd just finished telling Michael that I was planning to do that very thing. I'll have Simons wake me in time for my meeting. With Lord Liverpool? Francesca queried. Yes, at nine. Is it about the six acts? John nodded. Yes, and the return to the gold standard. I told you about it at breakfast, if you recall. Make sure you... She stopped, smiling as she shook her head. Well... You know how I feel. John smiled, then leaned down and dropped a tender kiss on her lips. I always know how you feel, darling. Michael pretended to look the other way. Not always, she said, her voice warm and teasing. Always when it matters, John said. Well, that is true, she admitted. So much for my attempts to be a lady of mystery. He kissed her again. I prefer you as an open book myself. Michael cleared his throat. This shouldn't be so difficult. It wasn't as if John and Francesca were acting any differently than was normal. They were, as so much of society had commented, like two peas in a pod, marvellously in accord and splendidly in love. It's growing late, Francesca said. I should go if I want that spot of fresh air. John nodded, closing his eyes for a moment. Are you sure you're well? I'm fine, he said. Just a headache. Francesca looped her hand into the crook of Michael's elbow. Be sure to take some laudanum when you return from your meeting, she said, over her shoulder, once they'd reached the door. Since I know you won't do it now. John nodded, his expression weary, then headed up the stairs. Poor John. Francesca said, stepping outside into the brisk night air. She took a deep inhale, then let out a sigh. I detest headaches. They always seem to lay me especially low. Never get them myself, Michael admitted, leading her down the steps to the pavement. Really? She looked up at him, one corner of her mouth quirking in that achingly familiar way. Lucky you! It almost made Michael laugh. Here he was, strolling through the night with the woman he loved. Lucky him. Chapter Two And if it were as bad as that, I suspect you would not tell me. As for the women, do at least try to make sure they are clean and free of disease. Beyond that... Do what you must to make your time bearable, and please try not to get yourself killed. At the risk of sounding maudlin, I don't know what I would do without you. From the Earl of Kilmartin to his cousin, Michael Sterling, sent in care of the 52nd Foot Guards during the Napoleonic Wars. For all his faults, and Francesca was willing to allow that Michael Sterling had many, he really was the dearest man. He was a horrible flirt. She'd seen him in action, and even she had to admit that otherwise intelligent women lost all measure of sense when he chose to be charming, and he certainly didn't approach his life with the gravity that she and John would have liked him to. But even with all that, she couldn't help but love him. He was the best friend John had ever had, until he'd married her, of course, and over the last two years, he'd become her close confidant as well. It was a funny thing, that. Who would have thought she'd have counted a man as one of her closest friends? She was not uncomfortable around men, 
Four brothers tended to wring the delicacy out of even the most feminine of creatures. But she was not like her sisters. Daphne and Eloise, and Hyacinth too, she supposed, although she was still a bit young to know for sure, were so open and sunny. They were the sorts of females who excelled at hunting and shooting, the kinds of pursuits that tended to get them labelled as jolly good sports. Men always felt comfortable in their presence, and the feeling was, Francesca had observed, entirely mutual. But she was different. She'd always felt a little different from the rest of her family. She loved them fiercely, and would have laid down her life for any one of them. But even though she looked like a Bridgerton, on the inside she always felt like a bit of a changeling. Where the rest of her family was outgoing, she was not shy precisely, but a bit more reserved, more careful with her words. She'd developed a reputation for irony and wit, and she had to admit she could rarely resist the opportunity to needle her siblings with a dry remark. It was done out of love, of course, and perhaps a touch of the desperation that comes from having spent far too much time with one's family, but they teased Francesca right back, so all was fair. It was the way of her family. They laughed, they teased, they bickered. Francesca's contributions to the din were simply a touch quieter than the rest, a bit more sly and subversive. She often wondered if part of her attraction to John had been the simple fact that he removed her from the chaos that was so often the Bridgerton household. Not that she didn't love him. She did. She adored him with every last breath in her body. He was her kindred spirit, so like her in so many ways. But it had, in a strange sort of fashion, been a relief to exit her mother's home— to escape to a more serene existence with John, whose sense of humour was precisely like hers. He understood her. He anticipated her. He completed her. It had been the oddest sensation when she'd met him, almost as if she were a jagged puzzle piece, finally finding its mate. Their first meeting hadn't been one of overwhelming love or passion— but rather filled with the most bizarre sense that she'd finally found the one person with whom she could completely be herself. It had been instant. It had been sudden. She couldn't remember just what it was he'd said to her, but from the moment words first left his lips, she had felt at home. And with him had come Michael, his cousin. Although, truth be told, the two men were much more like brothers. They'd been raised together— and they were so close in age that they'd shared everything. Well, almost everything. John was the heir to an earldom, and Michael was just his cousin, and so it was only natural that the two boys would not be treated quite the same. But from what Francesca had heard, and from what she knew of the Sterling family now, they had been loved in equal measure, and she rather thought that was the key to Michael's good humour because even though John had inherited the title, and the wealth, and, well, everything, Michael didn't seem to envy him. He didn't envy him. It was amazing to her. He'd been raised as John's brother, John's older brother even, and yet he'd never once begrudged John any of his blessings. And it was for that reason that Francesca loved him best— Michael would surely scoff if she tried to praise him for it, and she was quite certain that he would point to his many misdeeds, none of which, she feared, were exaggerated, to prove that his soul was black, and he was a scoundrel through and through. But the truth of the matter was that Michael Sterling possessed a generosity of spirit and a capability for love that was unmatched among men, and if she didn't find a wife for him soon— she was going to go mad. What? she said, aware that her voice was quite suddenly piercing the silence of the night. Is wrong with my sister? Francesca, he said, and she could hear irritation, and thankfully a bit of amusement as well in his voice. I'm not going to marry your sister. I didn't say you had to marry her. You didn't have to. Your face is an open book. She looked up at him, twisting her lips. You weren't even looking at me. 
Of course I was. And anyway, it wouldn't matter if I weren't. I know what you're about. He was right, and it scared her. Sometimes she worried that he understood her as well as John did. You need a wife, she said. Didn't you just promise your husband that you would stop pestering me about this? I did not, actually, she said, giving him a rather superior glance. He asked, of course. Of course, Michael muttered. She laughed. He could always make her laugh. I thought wives were supposed to accede to their husband's wishes, Michael said, quirking his right brow. In fact, I'm quite certain it's right there in the marriage vows. I'd be doing you a grave disservice if I found you a wife like that, she said, punctuating the sentiment with a well-timed and extremely disdainful snort. He turned and gazed down at her with a vaguely paternalistic expression. He should have been a nobleman, Francesca thought. He was far too irresponsible for the duties of a title. But when he looked at a person like that, all superciliousness and certitude, he might as well have been a royal duke. Your responsibilities as Countess of Kilmartin do not include finding me a wife, he said. They should. He laughed, which delighted her. She could always make him laugh. Very well she said, giving up for now. Tell me about something wicked, then. Something John would not approve of. It was a game they played, even in John's presence, although John always made at least the pretense of discouraging them. But Francesca suspected that John enjoyed Michael's tales as much as she did. Once he'd finished with his obligatory admonitions, he was always all ears. Not that Michael ever told them much. He was far too discreet for that. But he dropped hints and innuendo, and Francesca and John were always thoroughly entertained. They wouldn't trade their wedded bliss for anything. But who didn't like to be regaled with tales of debauchery and spice? I'm afraid I've done nothing wicked this week, Michael said, steering her around the corner to King Street. You? Impossible! It's only Tuesday, he reminded her. Yes, but not counting Sunday, which I'm sure you would not desecrate. She shot him a look that said she was quite certain he'd already sinned in every way possible, Sunday or no. That does leave you Monday, and a man can do quite a bit on a Monday. Not this man. Not this Monday. What did you do, then? He thought about that then said, "'Nothing, really.' "'That's impossible,' she teased. "'I'm quite certain I saw you awake for at least an hour.' He didn't say anything, and then he shrugged in a way she found oddly disturbing, and said, "'I did nothing. I walked, I spoke, I ate, but at the end of the day there was nothing.' Francesca impulsively squeezed his arm. "'We shall have to find you something,' she said softly. He turned and looked at her, his strange silvery eyes catching hers with an intensity she knew he didn't often allow to rise to the fore. And then it was gone, and he was himself again, except she suspected that Michael Sterling wasn't at all the man he wished people to believe him to be. even. Sometimes, her. We should return home, he said. It's growing late, and John will have my head if I let you catch a chill. John would blame me for my foolishness, and well you know it, Francesca said. This is just your way of telling me you have a woman waiting for you, probably draped in nothing but the sheets on her bed. He turned to her and grinned. It was wicked and devilish, and she understood why half the ton the female half, that was, fancied themselves in love with him, even with no title or fortune to his name. You said you wanted something wicked, didn't you? he asked. Did you want more detail? The colour of the sheets, perhaps? She blushed, drat it all. She hated that she blushed, but at least the reaction was covered by the night. Not yellow, I hope, she said, 
because she couldn't bear to let the conversation end on her embarrassment. It makes you look sallow. I won't be wearing the sheets, he drawled. Nevertheless, he chuckled, and she knew that he knew that she'd said it just to have the last word, and she thought he was going to allow her the small victory. But then, just when she was beginning to find relief in the silence, he said, Red. I beg your pardon? But of course she knew what he meant. Red sheets, I think. I can't believe you told me that. You asked, Francesca Sterling. He looked down at her, and one lock of midnight black hair fell onto his forehead. You're just lucky I don't tell your husband on you. John would never worry over me, she said. For a moment, she didn't think he would reply, but then he said, I know, and his voice was oddly grave and serious. It's the only reason I tease you. She'd been watching the pavement, looking for rough spots, but his tone was so serious she had to look up. You're the only woman I know who would never stray, he said, touching her chin. You have no idea how much I admire you for that. I love your cousin, she whispered. I would never betray him. He brought his hand back to his side. I know. He looked so handsome in the moonlight, and so unbearably in need of love, that her heart nearly broke. Surely there was no woman who could resist him, not with that perfect face and tall, muscular body, and anyone who took the time to explore what was underneath would come to know him as she did, as a kind-hearted man, loyal and true. With a hint of the devil, of course, but Francesca supposed that was what would attract the ladies in the first place. Shall we? Michael said, suddenly all charm. He tilted his head back in the direction of home, and she sighed and turned around. Thank you for taking me out, she said, after a few minutes of companionable silence. I wasn't exaggerating when I said I was going mad with the rain. You didn't say that he said, immediately giving himself a mental kick. She'd said that she'd been feeling a bit odd, not that she'd been going mad, but only an idiot savant or a lovesick fool would have noticed the difference. Didn't I? She scrunched her brow together. Well, I was certainly thinking it. I've been rather sluggish, if you must know. The fresh air did me a great deal of good. Then I'm happy to have helped he said gallantly. She smiled as they ascended the front steps to kill Martin House. The door opened as their feet touched the top stair. The butler must have been watching for them, and then Michael waited as Francesca was divested of her cloak in the front hall. Will you stay for another drink, or must you leave immediately for your appointment? she inquired, her eyes glinting with the devil. He glanced at the clock at the end of the hall. It was half eight, and while he had no place to be, there was no lady waiting for him, although he could certainly find one at the drop of a hat, and he rather thought he would. He didn't much feel like remaining here at Kilmartin House. I must go, he said. I've much to do. You've nothing to do, and you know it, she said. You just wish to be wicked. It's an admirable pastime, he murmured. She opened her mouth to offer a retort, but just then Simons, John's recently hired valet, came down the stairs. My lady, he inquired. Francesca turned to him and inclined her head, indicating that he should proceed. I've rapped on his lordship's door and called his name, twice, but he seems to be sleeping quite soundly. Do you still wish me to wake him? Francesca nodded. Yes, I'd love to let him sleep. He's been working so hard lately. She directed this last bit at Michael. But I know that this meeting with Lord Liverpool is very important. You should. No, wait. I'll rouse him myself. It will be better that way. She turned to Michael. I shall see you tomorrow. Actually, if John hasn't yet left, I'll wait, he replied. I came on foot. So I might as well avail myself of his carriage once he's done with it.'
She nodded and hurried up the stairs, leaving Michael with nothing to do but hum under his breath as he idly examined the paintings in the hall. And then she screamed. Michael had no recollection of running up the stairs, but somehow there he was, in John's and Francesca's bedchamber, the one room in the house he never invaded. Francesca, he gasped. Franny, Franny, what is... She was sitting next to the bed, clutching John's forearm, which was dangling over the side. Wake him up, Michael, she cried. Wake him up! Do it for me! Wake him up! Michael felt his world slip away. The bed was across the room, a good twelve feet away. But he knew. No one knew John as well as he did. No one. And John wasn't there in the room. He was gone. What was on the bed? It wasn't John. Francesca, he whispered, moving slowly toward her. His limbs felt strange and funny and gruesomely sluggish. Francesca. She looked up at him with huge, stricken eyes. Wake him up, Michael. Francesca, I... No! She screamed, launching herself at him. Wake him up! You can do it! Wake him up! Wake him up! And all he could do was stand there as she beat her fists against his chest. Stand there as she grabbed his cravat and shook and yanked until he was gasping for breath. He couldn't even embrace her, couldn't offer her comfort, because he was every bit as devastated and confused. And then suddenly the fire left her, and she collapsed in his arms, her tears soaking his shirt. He had a headache, she whimpered. That's all. He just had a headache. It was just a headache. She looked up at him, her eyes searching his face, looking for answers he'd never be able to give her. It was just a headache, she said again, and she looked broken. I know, he said, even though he knew it wasn't enough. Oh, Michael, she sobbed. What am I to do? I don't know, he said, because he didn't. Between Eton... Cambridge and the army, he'd been trained for everything that the life of an English gentleman was supposed to offer. But he hadn't been trained for this. I don't understand, she was saying, and he supposed she was saying a lot of things, but none of it made any sense to his ears. He didn't even have the strength to stand, and together the two of them sank to the carpet, leaning against the side of the bed. He stared sightlessly at the far wall, wondering why he wasn't crying. He was numb, and his body felt heavy, and he couldn't shake the feeling that his very soul had been ripped from his body. Not John. Why? Why? And as he sat there, dimly aware of the servants gathering just outside the open door, it occurred to him that Francesca was whimpering those very same words. Not John. Why? Why? Do you think she might be with child? Michael stared at Lord Winston, a new and apparently over-eager appointee to the Committee for Privileges of the House of Lords, trying to make sense of his words. John had been dead barely a day. It was still hard to make sense of anything. And now, here was this puffy little man, demanding an audience, prattling on about some sacred duty to the crown. Her ladyship, Lord Winston said, if she's carrying, it will complicate everything. I don't know, Michael said. I didn't ask her. You need to. I'm sure you're eager to assume control of your new holdings, but we really must determine if she's carrying. Furthermore, if she is pregnant, a member of our committee will need to be present at the birth. Michael felt his face go slack. I beg your pardon, he somehow managed to say. Baby switching, Lord Winston said grimly. There have been instances. For God's sake, it's for your protection as much as anyone's, Lord Winston cut in. <laughs> 
If her ladyship gives birth to a girl, and there is no one present to witness it, what is to stop her from switching the babe with a boy? Michael couldn't even bring himself to dignify this with an answer. You need to find out if she is carrying, Lord Winston pressed. Arrangements will need to be made. She was widowed yesterday, Michael said sharply. I will not burden her with such intrusive questions. There is more at stake here than her ladyship's feelings, Lord Winston returned. We cannot properly transfer the earldom while there is doubt as to the succession. The devil take the earldom, Michael snapped. Lord Winston gasped, drawing back in visible horror. You forget yourself, my lord. I'm not your lord, Michael bit off. I'm not anyone's. He halted his words, sinking into a chair, trying very hard to get past the fact that he was perilously close to tears. Right here in John's study, with this damnable little man who didn't seem to understand that a man had died. Not just an earl, but a man. Michael wanted to cry. And he would, he suspected. As soon as Lord Winston left, and Michael could lock the door and make sure that no one could see him, he would probably bury his face in his hands and cry. Someone has to ask her, Lord Winston said. It won't be me, Michael said in a low voice. I will do it then. Michael leapt from his seat and pinned Lord Winston against the wall. You will not approach Lady Kilmartin, he growled. You will not even breathe the same air. Do I make myself clear? Quite, the smaller man gurgled. Michael let go, dimly aware that Lord Winston's face was beginning to turn purple. Get out, he said. You will need... Get out, he roared. I will come back tomorrow, Lord Winston said, skittering out the door. We will speak when you are in a calmer frame of mind. Michael leaned against the wall, staring at the open doorway. Good God, how had it all come to this? John hadn't even been thirty. He was the picture of health. Michael might have been second in line for the earldom as long as John and Francesca's marriage remained childless, but no one had truly thought he'd ever inherit. Already he'd heard that men in the clubs were calling him the luckiest man in Britain. Overnight, He'd gone from the fringe of aristocracy to its very epicentre. No one seemed to understand that Michael had never wanted this. Never. He didn't want an earldom. He wanted his cousin back. And no one seemed to understand that. Except, perhaps, Francesca. But she was so wrapped in her own grief that she could not quite comprehend the pain in Michael's heart. And he would never ask her to. Not when she was so wrecked by her own. Michael wrapped his arms against his chest as he thought of her. For the rest of his life, he would not forget the sight of Francesca's face once the truth had finally sunk in. John was not sleeping. He was not going to wake up. And Francesca Bridgerton Sterling was, at the tender age of two and twenty, the saddest thing imaginable. Alone. Michael understood her despair better than anyone could ever imagine. They'd put her to bed that night, he and her mother, who had hurried over at Michael's urgent summons, and she'd slept like a baby, with nary even a whimper, her body worn out from the shock of it all. But when she'd awakened the next morning, she'd acquired the proverbial stiff upper lip, determined to remain strong and steadfast, handling the myriad details that had showered down upon the house at John's death. The problem was, neither one of them had a clue what those details were. They were young. They had been carefree. They had never thought to deal with death. Who knew, for example, that the Committee for Privileges would get involved and demand a box seat at what ought to be a private moment for Francesca, if indeed she was even carrying but bloody hell, he wasn't going to ask her. We need to tell his mother, Francesca had said earlier that morning. It was the first thing she'd said, actually. There was no preamble, no greeting, 
just... We need to tell his mother. Michael had nodded, since of course she was right. We need to tell your mother, too. They're both in Scotland. They won't know yet. He nodded again. It was all he could manage. I'll write the notes. And he nodded a third time, wondering what he was supposed to do. That question had been answered when Lord Winston had come to call. But Michael couldn't bear to think about all that now. It seemed so distasteful. He didn't want to think of all he would gain at John's death. How could anyone possibly speak as if something good had come of all this? Michael felt himself sinking down, down, sliding against the wall until he was sitting on the floor, his legs bent in front of him, his head resting on his knees. He hadn't wanted this, had he? He'd wanted Francesca, that was all, but not like this, not at this cost. He'd never begrudged John his good fortune. He'd never coveted the title, the money, or the power. He'd merely coveted his wife. Now he was meant to assume John's title, step into his shoes, and guilt was squeezing its merciless fist right around his heart. Had he somehow wished for this? No, he couldn't have. He hadn't. Had he? Michael. He looked up. It was Francesca, still wearing that hollow look, her face a blank mask that tore at his heart far more than her wailing sorrow ever could have done. I sent for Janet. He nodded. John's mother. She would be devastated. And your mother as well. She would be equally bereft. Is there anyone else you think... He shook his head, aware that he should get up, aware that propriety dictated that he rise, but he just couldn't find the strength. He didn't want Francesca to see him so weak, but he couldn't help it. You should sit down, he finally said. You need to rest. I can't, she said. I need to... If I stop, even for a moment, I will... Her words trailed off. But it didn't matter. He understood. He looked up at her. Her chestnut hair was pulled back into a simple queue, and her face was pale. She looked young, barely out of the schoolroom, certainly too young for this sort of heartbreak. Francesca, he said, his word not quite a question, more of a sigh, really. And then she said it. She said it without his having to ask. I'm pregnant. Chapter 3 I love him madly, madly. Truly, I would die without him. From the Countess of Kilmartin to her sister, Eloise Bridgerton, one week after Francesca's wedding. I declare, Francesca... You are the healthiest expectant mother I have ever laid eyes upon. Francesca smiled at her mother-in-law, who had just entered the garden of the St. James's mansion they now shared. Overnight, it seemed, Kilmartin House had become a household of women. First, Janet had taken up residence, and then Helen, Michael's mother. It was a house full of sterling females, or at least those who had acquired the name in marriage. And it all felt so different. It was strange. She would have thought that she'd sense John's presence, feel him in the air, see him in the surroundings they'd shared for two years. But instead, he was simply gone, and the influx of women had changed the tone of the house entirely. Francesca supposed that was a good thing. She needed the support of women right now. But it was odd, living among women. There were more flowers now, vases everywhere, it seemed and there was no longer any lingering smell of John's cheroot or the sandalwood soap he'd favoured. Kilmartin House now smelled of lavender and rose water, and every whiff of it broke Francesca's heart. Even Michael had been strangely distant. Oh, he came to call, several times a week, if one cared to count, which Francesca had to admit she did. 
But he wasn't there. Not in the way he had been before John's death. He wasn't the same, and she supposed she ought not to castigate him for that, even if only in her mind. He was hurting too. She knew that. She reminded herself of it when she saw him, and his eyes were distant. She reminded herself of it when she didn't know what to say to him, and when he didn't tease her. And she reminded herself of it when they sat together in the drawing-room and had nothing to say. She'd lost John, and now it seemed she'd lost Michael too. And even with two mother hens fussing over her, three, if she counted her own, who came to call every single day, she was so lonely and sad. No one had ever told her how sad she'd be. Who would have thought to tell her? And even if someone had, even if her mother, who had also been widowed young, had explained the pain, how could she have understood? It was one of those things that had to be experienced to be understood. And, oh, how Francesca wished she didn't belong to this melancholy club. And where was Michael? Why couldn't he comfort her? Why didn't he realise how very much she needed him? Him, not his mother, not anyone's mother. She needed Michael, the one person who had known John the way she had, the only person who had loved him as fully. Michael was her one link to the husband she had lost, and she hated him for staying away. Even when he was here at Kilmartin House, in the same dashed room as her, it wasn't the same. They didn't joke and they didn't tease. They just sat there and looked sad and grief-stricken, and when they spoke, there was an awkwardness that had never been there before. Couldn't anything remain as it was before John had died? It had never occurred to her that her friendship with Michael might be killed off as well. How are you feeling, dear? Francesca looked up at Janet, belatedly realising that her mother-in-law had asked her a question. Several, probably, and she'd forgotten to answer, lost in her own thoughts. She did that a lot lately. Fine, she said. No different than I ever have done. Janet shook her head in wonder. It's remarkable. I've never heard of such a thing. Francesca shrugged. If it weren't for the loss of my courses, I'd never know anything was different. And it was true. She wasn't sick. She wasn't hungry. She wasn't anything. A trifle more tired than usual, she supposed. But that could be the grief as well. Her mother had told her that she'd been tired for a year after her father had died. Of course, her mother had had eight children to look after. Francesca just had herself, with a small army of servants treating her like an invalid queen. You're very fortunate, Janet said, sitting down on the chair opposite Francesca's. When I was carrying John, I was sick every single morning, and most afternoons as well. Francesca nodded and smiled. Janet had told this to her before, several times. John's death had turned his mother into a magpie, constantly chattering on, trying to fill the silence that was Francesca's grief. Francesca adored her for it, for trying, but she suspected the only thing that would assuage her pain was time. "'I'm so pleased you're carrying,' Janet said, leaning forward and impulsively squeezing Francesca's hand. It makes it all a bit more bearable. Or, I suppose, a bit less unbearable, she added, not really smiling, but looking like she was trying to. Francesca just nodded, afraid that speaking would loosen the tears in her eyes. I'd always wanted more children, Janet confessed, but it wasn't to be. And when John died, I... well... Let's just say that no grandchild shall ever be loved more than the one you're carrying. She stopped, pretending to dab her handkerchief against her nose, but really aiming for her eyes. Don't tell anyone, but I don't care whether it's a boy or a girl. It's a piece of him. That's all that matters. I know, Francesca said softly, placing her hand on her belly. She wished there was some sign of the baby within. She knew it was too soon to feel movement, 
she wasn't even three months along, by her carefully calculated estimation. But all her dresses still fit perfectly, and her food still tasted just as it always had, and she simply wasn't experiencing any of the quirks and illnesses that other women had told her about. She'd have been happy to have been casting up her accounts each morning, if only so that she could imagine the baby was waving its hand with a cheerful, I'm here. Have you seen Michael recently? Janet asked. Not since Monday, Francesca said. He doesn't come to call very often any more. He misses John, Janet said softly. So do I, Francesca replied, and she was horrified by the sharp edge to her voice. It must be very difficult for him. Janet mused. Francesca just stared at her, her lips parting with surprise. I do not mean to say it is not difficult for you, too, Janet said quickly. But think of the tenuousness of his position. He won't know if he's to be the Earl for six more months. There is nothing I can do about that. No, of course not, Janet assured her. But it does put him in awkward straits. I've heard more than one matron say that they simply can't consider him as a potential suitor for their daughters until and unless you give birth to a girl. It's one thing to marry the Earl of Kilmartin. It's quite another when it's his impoverished cousin, and no one knows which he will be. Michael isn't impoverished, Francesca said peevishly, and besides, he would never marry while in mourning for John. No, I suppose not, but I do hope he starts looking, Janet said. I do so want him to be happy, and of course, if he is to be the Earl, he shall have to beget an heir. Otherwise, the title shall go to that awful Debenham side of the family. Janet shuddered at the thought. Michael will do what he must, Francesca said, although she wasn't so sure. It was difficult to imagine him marrying. It had always been difficult. Michael wasn't the sort to stay true to any woman for very long, but now it just seemed strange. For years she had had John, and Michael had been their companion. Could she bear it if he married, and then she was the third wheel? Was her heart big enough to be happy for him while she was alone? She rubbed her eyes. She felt very tired— and, in truth, a bit weak. A good sign, she supposed. She'd heard that pregnant women were supposed to be more tired than she usually was. She looked over at Janet. I think I shall go upstairs and take a nap. An excellent idea, Janet said approvingly. You need your rest. Francesca nodded and stood, then grabbed the arm of the chair to steady herself when she swayed. I don't know what is wrong with me she said, attempting a wobbly smile. I feel very unsteady. I... Janet's gasp cut her off. Janet? Francesca looked at her mother-in-law with concern. She'd gone quite pale, and one shaking hand rose to meet her lips. What is it? Francesca asked, and then she realised that Janet wasn't looking at her. She was looking at her chair. With slowly dawning horror, Francesca looked down, forcing herself to look at the seat she'd just vacated. There, in the middle of the cushion, was a small patch of red. Blood. Life would have been easier, Michael thought wryly, if he'd been given to drink. If ever there was a time to overindulge, to drown one's sorrows in the bottle, this was it. But no. He'd been cursed with a robust constitution and a marvellous ability to hold his liquor with dignity and flair, which meant that if he wanted to reach any sort of mind-numbing oblivion, he'd have to down the entire bottle of whisky sitting on his desk, and maybe even then some. He looked out the window. It wasn't yet dark. Even he, dissolute rake that he tried to be, couldn't bring himself to drink an entire bottle of whisky before the sun went down. Michael tapped his fingers against his desk, wishing he knew what to do with himself. John had been dead for six weeks now, but he was still living in his modest apartments in the Albany. 
he couldn't quite bring himself to take up residence in Kilmartin House. It was the residence of the Earl, and that wouldn't be him for at least another six months. Or maybe not ever. According to Lord Winston, whose lectures Michael had eventually been forced to tolerate, the title would go into abeyance, until Francesca delivered. And if she gave birth to a boy, Michael would remain in the same position he'd always been in, cousin to the Earl. But it wasn't Michael's peculiar situation that was keeping him away. He'd have been reticent to move into Kilmartin House, even if Francesca hadn't been pregnant. She was still there. She was still there, and she was still the Countess of Kilmartin. And even if he was the Earl, with no questions attached to the title, she wouldn't be his Countess, and he just didn't know if he could take the irony of it. He'd thought that his grief might finally overtake his longing for her, that he might finally be with her and not want her. But no, his breath still caught every time she walked into the room, and his body tightened when she brushed past him, and his heart still ached with the pain of loving her. Except now it was all wrapped in an extra layer of guilt, as if he hadn't had enough of that while John was alive. She was in pain, and she was grieving, and he ought to be comforting her, not lusting after her. Good God! John wasn't even cold in his grave. What kind of monster would lust after his wife? His pregnant wife? He was already stepping into John's shoes in so many ways. He would not complete the betrayal by taking his place with Francesca as well. And so he stayed away. Not completely. That would have been too obvious. And besides, he couldn't do that. Not with his mother and John's in residence at Kilmartin House. Plus, everyone was looking to him to manage the affairs of the Earl, even though the title wasn't potentially to be his for another six months. He did it, though. He didn't mind the details, didn't care that he was spending several hours per day looking after a fortune that might go to another. It was the least he could do for John, and for Francesca. He couldn't bring himself to be a friend to her, not the way he ought, but he could make sure that her financial affairs were in order. But he knew she didn't understand. She often came to visit him while he was working in John's study at Kilmartin House, poring over reports from various land stewards and solicitors, and he could tell that she was looking for their old camaraderie. But he just couldn't do it. Call him weak, call him shallow, but he just couldn't be her friend. Not just yet, anyway. Mr. Sterling? Michael looked up. His valet was at the door, accompanied by a footman, dressed in the unmistakable green and gold livery of Kilmartin House. A message for you, the footman said, from your mother. Michael held out his hand as the footman crossed the room, wondering what it was this time. His mother summoned him to kill Martin House every other day, it seemed. She said it was urgent, the footman added, as he placed the envelope in Michael's hand. Urgent, eh? That was new. Michael glanced up at the footman and valet, his steady gaze a clear dismissal, and then, once the room had been emptied, slid his letter opener under the flap. Come quickly, was all it said. Francesca has lost the baby. Michael nearly killed himself rushing to kill Martin House, racing on horseback at a breakneck pace, ignoring the shouts from the angry pedestrians he'd nearly decapitated in his haste. But now that he was here, standing in the hall, he had no idea what to do with himself. Miscarriage? It seemed such a womanly thing. What was he meant to do? It was a tragedy, and he felt horrible for Francesca. But what did they think he could say? Why did they want him here? And then it hit him. He was the Earl now. It was done. Slowly but surely, he was assuming John's life, filling every corner of the world that had once belonged to his cousin. Oh, Michael! his mother said, rushing into the hall. I'm so glad you're here. He embraced her, his arms awkwardly coming around her.
and he said something utterly meaningless like, Such a tragedy. But mostly he just stood there, feeling foolish and out of place. How was she? he finally asked, once his mother stepped back. In shock, she replied. She's been crying. He swallowed, wanting desperately to loosen his cravat. Well, that's to be expected, he said. I... I... She can't seem to stop, Helen interrupted. Crying, Michael asked. Helen nodded. I don't know what to do. Michael measured his breaths. Even. Slow. In and out. Michael? His mother was looking up to him for a response. Maybe for guidance. As if he would know what to do. Her mother came by, Helen said, when it became apparent that Michael was not going to speak. She wants Francesca to go back to Bridgerton House. Does Francesca want to? Helen shrugged sadly. I don't think she knows. It's all such a shock. Yes, Michael said, swallowing again. He didn't want to be here. He wanted to get out. The doctor said we're not to move her for several days in any case, Helen added. He nodded. Naturally, we called for you. Naturally. There was nothing natural about it. He'd never felt so out of place, so completely at a loss for words or action. You're Kill Martin now, his mother said quietly. He nodded again. Just once. It was as much of an acknowledgement as he could muster. I must say I... Helen stopped, her lips pursing in an odd, jerky manner. Well, a mother wants the world for her children, but I didn't... I never would have... Don't say it, Michael said hoarsely. He wasn't ready for anyone to say this was a good thing. And by God, if anyone offered his congratulations, well, he wouldn't be responsible for the violence. She asked for you, his mother said. Francesca, he asked, his eyes flying open with surprise. Helen nodded. She said she wanted you. I can't he said. You have to. I can't. He shook his head, panic making his movements too quick. I can't go in there. You can't abandon her, his mother said. She was never mine to abandon. Michael, Helen gasped. How can you say such a thing? Mother, he said, desperately trying to redirect the conversation. She needs a woman. What can I do? You can be her friend, Helen said softly, and he felt eight again, scolded for a thoughtless transgression. No, he said, and his voice horrified him. He sounded like a wounded animal, pained and confused, but there was one thing he knew for certain. He couldn't see her. Not now. Not yet. Michael, his mother said. No he said again. I will... tomorrow. I'll... And he strode for the door with nothing more than a... Give her my best. And then he fled, coward that he was. Chapter Four I am sure it is not worth such high drama... I do not profess to know or understand romantic love between husband and wife, but surely it is not so all-encompassing that the loss of one would destroy the other. You are stronger than you think, dear sister. You would survive quite handily without him, moot point though it may be. From Eloise Bridgerton to her sister, the Countess of Kilmartin, three weeks after Francesca's wedding. The following month was, Michael was certain, the best approximation of hell on earth that any human being was likely to experience. With every new ceremony, each and every document he found himself signing as Kill Martin, or My Lord, he was forced to endure, it was as if John's spirit was being pushed farther away. Soon, Michael thought dispassionately, it would be as if he'd never existed. Even the baby, 
who was to have been the last piece of John Sterling left on earth, was gone, and everything that had been John's was now Michael's, except Francesca, and Michael intended to keep it that way. He would not, no, he could not offer his cousin that last insult. He'd had to see her, of course, and he'd offered his best words of comfort, but whatever he'd said, it wasn't the right thing, and she'd just turned her head and looked at the wall. He didn't know what to say. Frankly, he was more relieved that she was not injured than he was upset that the baby had been lost. The mother's, his, John's, and Francesca's, had felt compelled to describe the gore to him in appalling detail, and one of the maids had even trotted out the bloody sheets, which someone had saved to offer as proof that Francesca had miscarried. Lord Winston had nodded approvingly, but had then added that he would have to keep an eye on the Countess, just to be sure that the sheets were truly hers, and that she wasn't actually increasing. This wouldn't be the first time someone had tried to circumvent the sacred laws of primogeniture, he'd added. Michael had wanted to hurl the yappy little man out the window, but instead he'd merely shown him the door. He no longer had energy for that kind of anger, it seemed. He still hadn't moved into Kilmartin House. He wasn't quite ready for it, and the thought of living there with all those women was suffocating. He'd have to do so soon, he knew. It was expected of the Earl. But for now, he was content enough in his small suite of apartments. And that was where he was, avoiding his duties, when Francesca finally sought him out. Michael, she said, once his valet had shown her to his small sitting-room. Francesca, he replied, shocked at her appearance. She'd never come here before— not when John had been alive, and certainly not after. What are you doing here? I wanted to see you, she said, the unspoken message being, you're avoiding me. It was the truth, of course, but all he said was, sit down, and then belatedly, please. Was this improper, her being here in his apartments? He wasn't sure. The circumstances of their position were so odd, so completely out of order, that he had no idea which rules of etiquette were currently governing them. She sat, and did nothing but fiddle her fingers against her skirts for a full minute, and then she looked up at him, her eyes meeting his with heartbreaking intensity, and said, I miss you. The walls began to close in around him, Francesca, I... You were my friend, she said accusingly. Besides John, you were my closest friend, and I don't know who you are any longer. I... Oh, he felt like a fool, utterly impotent, and brought down by a pair of blue eyes and a mountain of guilt. Guilt for what? He wasn't even certain any longer. It seemed to come from so many sources from such a variety of directions, that he couldn't quite keep track of it. "'What is wrong with you?' she asked. "'Why do you avoid me?' "'I don't know,' he replied, since he couldn't lie to her and say that he wasn't. She was too smart for that. But neither could he tell her the truth. Her lips quivered, and then the lower one caught between her teeth. He stared at it, unable to take his eyes off her mouth— hating himself for the rush of longing that swept over him. "'You were supposed to be my friend, too,' she whispered. "'Francesca, don't.' "'I needed you,' she said softly. "'I still do.' "'No, you don't,' he replied. "'You have the mothers, and all your sisters as well.' "'I don't want to talk to my sisters,' she said, her voice growing impassioned. "'They don't understand.' Well, I certainly don't understand, he shot back, desperation lending an unpleasant edge to his voice. She just stared at him, condemnation colouring her eyes. Francesca, you... He wanted to throw up his arms, but instead he just crossed them. You... you miscarried. 
I am aware of that, she said tightly. What do I know of such things? You need to talk to a woman. Can't you say you're sorry? I did say I was sorry. Can't you mean it? What did she want from him? Francesca, I did mean it. I'm just so angry, she said, her voice rising in intensity. And I'm sad, and I'm upset, and I look at you and I don't understand why you're not. For a moment he didn't move. Don't you ever say that, he whispered. Her eyes flashed with anger. Well, you've a funny way of showing it. You never call, and you never speak to me, and you don't understand. What do you want me to understand? he burst out. What can I understand? For the love of... He stopped himself before he blasphemed and turned away from her, leaning heavily on the window sill. Behind him, Francesca just sat quietly, still as death. And then, finally, she said, I don't know why I came. I'll go. Don't go, he said hoarsely, but he didn't turn around. She said nothing. She wasn't sure what he meant. You only just arrived, he said, his voice halting and awkward. You should have a cup of tea at least. Francesca nodded, even though he still wasn't looking at her. And they remained thus for several minutes, for far too long, until she could not bear the silence any longer. The clock ticked in the corner, and her only company was Michael's back, and all she could do was sit there and think and think and wonder why she'd come here. What did she want from him? And wouldn't her life be easier if she actually knew? Michael! she said, his name leaving her lips before she realised it. He turned around. He didn't speak, but he acknowledged her with his eyes. I... Why had she called out to him? What did she want? I... Still he didn't speak, just stood there and waited for her to collect her thoughts, which made everything so much harder. And then, to her horror, it spilled out. I don't know what I'm supposed to do now, she said, hearing her voice break. And I'm so angry, and... She stopped, gasped, anything to halt the tears. Across from her, Michael opened his mouth, but only barely, and even then nothing came out. I don't know why this is happening, she whimpered. What did I do? What did I ever do? Nothing, he assured her. He's gone, and he isn't coming back, and I'm so, so... She looked up at him, feeling the grief and the anger etching themselves into her face. It isn't fair. It isn't fair that it's me and not someone else. And it isn't fair that it should be anyone. And it isn't fair that I lost them. And then she choked, and the gasps became sobs, and all she could do was cry. Francesca. Michael said, kneeling at her feet. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I know, she sobbed. But it doesn't make it better. No, he murmured. But it doesn't make it fair. No, he said again. And it doesn't. It doesn't. He didn't try to finish the sentence for her. She wished he had. For years she wished he had because maybe then he would have said the wrong thing, and maybe then she wouldn't have leaned into him, and maybe then she wouldn't have allowed him to hold her. But, oh, God, how she missed being held. Why did you go? she cried. Why can't you help me? I want to. You don't... And then finally he just said, I don't know what to say. She was asking too much of him. She knew it, but she didn't care. She was just so sick of being alone. But right then, at least for a moment, she wasn't alone. Michael was there, and he was holding her, and she felt warm and safe for the first time in weeks, and she just cried. She cried weeks of tears. She cried for John, and she cried for the baby she'd never know.
but most of all, she cried for herself. Michael, she said, once she'd recovered enough to speak. Her voice was still shaky, but she managed his name, and she knew she was going to have to manage more. Yes. We can't go on like this. She felt something change in him. His embrace tightened, or maybe it loosened, but something was not quite the same. Like what? he asked, his voice hoarse and hesitant. She drew back so she could see him, relieved when his arms fell away, and she didn't have to wriggle free. Like this, she said, even though she knew he didn't understand. Or if he did, that he was going to pretend otherwise. With you ignoring me, she continued. Francesca, I... The baby was to have been yours in a way, too, she blurted out. He went pale, deathly pale, so much so that for a moment she couldn't breathe. What do you mean? he whispered. It would have needed a father, she said, shrugging helplessly. I... you... it would have had to be you. You have brothers, he choked out. They didn't know John, not the way you did. He moved away, stood, and then, as if that weren't enough, backed up as far as he could, all the way to the window. His eyes flared slightly, and for a moment she could have sworn that he resembled a trapped animal, cornered and terrified, waiting for the finality of the kill. Why are you telling me this? he said, his voice flat and low. I don't know, she said, swallowing uncomfortably. But she did know. She wanted him to grieve as she grieved. She wanted him to hurt in every way she hurt. It wasn't fair, and it wasn't nice, but she couldn't help it, and she didn't feel like apologising for it either. Francesca, he said, and his tone was strange, hollow and sharp, and like nothing she'd ever heard. She looked at him, but she moved her head slowly, scared by what she might see in his face. I'm not John, he said. I know that. I'm not John, he said again, louder, and she wondered if he'd even heard her. I know. His eyes narrowed and focused on her with dangerous intensity. It wasn't my baby, and I can't be what you need. And inside of her, something started to die. Michael, I... I won't take his place, he said, and he wasn't shouting, but it sounded like maybe he wanted to. No, you couldn't. You... And then, in a startling flash of motion, he was at her side, and he'd grabbed her shoulders and hauled her to her feet. I won't do it! he yelled, and he was shaking her, and then holding her still, and then shaking her again. I can't be him! I won't be him! She couldn't speak. Couldn't form words, didn't know what to do, didn't know who he was. He stopped shaking her, but his fingers bit into her shoulders as he stared down at her, his quicksilver eyes afire with something terrifying and sad. You can't ask this of me, he gasped. I can't do it. Michael, she whispered, hearing something awful in her voice, fear. Michael, please let me go. He didn't, but she wasn't even sure he'd heard her. His eyes were lost, and he seemed beyond her, unreachable. Michael, she said again, and her voice was louder, panicked. And then, abruptly, he did as she asked, and he stumbled back, his face a portrait of self-loathing. I'm sorry, he whispered staring at his hands as if they were foreign bodies. I'm so sorry. Francesca edged toward the door. I'd better go, she said. He nodded. Yes. I think... She stopped, choking on the word as she grasped the doorknob, clutching it like her salvation. 
I think we had better not see each other for a while. He nodded jerkily. Maybe. But she didn't say anything more. She didn't know what to say. If she'd known what had just happened between them, she might have found some words. But for now, she was too bewildered and scared to figure it all out. Scared? But why? She certainly wasn't scared of him. Michael would never hurt her. He'd lay down his life for her if the opportunity forced itself. She was quite sure of that. Maybe she was just scared of tomorrow. And the day after that. She'd lost everything. And now it appeared she'd lost Michael as well. And she just wasn't sure how she was supposed to bear it all. I'm going to go, she said, giving him one last chance to stop her. To say something. To say anything that might make it all go away. But he didn't. He didn't even nod. He just looked at her, his eyes silent in their agreement. And Francesca left. She walked out the door and out of his house, and then she climbed into her carriage and went home. And she didn't say a word. She climbed up her stairs, and she climbed into her bed. But she didn't cry. She kept thinking she should, kept feeling like she might like to. But all she did was stare at the ceiling. The ceiling, at least, didn't mind her regard. Back in his apartments in the Albany, Michael grabbed his bottle of whiskey and poured himself a tall glass, even though a glance at the clock revealed the day to be still younger than noon. He'd sunk to a new low. That much was clear. But try as he might, he couldn't figure out what else he could have done. It wasn't as if he'd meant to hurt her, and he certainly hadn't stopped, pondered, and decided, Oh, yes, I do believe I shall act like an ass. But even though his reactions had been swift and unconsidered, he didn't see how he might have behaved any other way. He knew himself. He didn't always, or these days even often, like himself. But he knew himself. And when Francesca had turned to him with those bottomless blue eyes and said, The baby was to have been yours in a way, too. She'd shattered him to his very soul. She didn't know. She had no idea. And as long as she remained in the dark about his feelings for her, as long as she couldn't understand why he had no choice but to hate himself for every step he took in John's shoes, he couldn't be near her. Because she was going to keep saying things like that, and he simply didn't know how much he could take. And so, as he stood in his study, his body taut with misery and guilt, he realised two things. The first was easy. The whisky was doing nothing to ease his pain, and if twenty-five-year-old whisky, straight from Speyside, didn't make him feel any better, nothing in the British Isles was going to do so. Which led him to the second, which wasn't easy at all. But he had to do it. Rarely had the choices in his life been so clear. Painful, but painfully clear. And so he set down his glass, two fingers of the amber liquid remaining, and he walked down the hall to his bedchamber. Reavers, he said, upon finding his valet standing at the wardrobe, carefully folding a cravat, what do you think of India? Part 2 March, 1824 Four years later Chapter 5 You would enjoy it here. Not the heat, I should think. No one seems to enjoy the heat. But the rest would enchant you. The colours, the spices, the scent of the air... They can place one in a strange, sensuous haze that is a turns unsettling and intoxicating. Most of all, I think you would enjoy the pleasure gardens. They are rather like our London parks, except far more green and lush, and full of the most remarkable flowers you have ever seen. You have always loved to be out among nature. This you would adore. I am quite sure of it. From Michael Sterling the new Earl of Kilmartin, 
to the Countess of Kilmartin one month after his arrival in India. Francesca wanted a baby. She had for quite some time, but it was only in recent months that she'd been able to admit as much to herself, to finally put words to the sense of longing that seemed to accompany her wherever she went. It had started innocently enough, with a little pang in her heart, upon reading a letter from her brother's wife Kate, the missive filled with news of their little girl Charlotte, soon to turn to and already incorrigible. But the pang had grown worse, into something more akin to an ache, when her sister Daphne had arrived in Scotland for a visit, all four of her children in tow. It hadn't occurred to Francesca just how completely a gaggle of children could transform a home. The Hastings children had altered the very essence of Kilmartin, brought it to life and laughter that Francesca realised had been sadly lacking for years. And then they left, and all was quiet. But it wasn't peaceful, just empty. From that moment on, Francesca was different. She saw a nursemaid pushing a pram, and her heart ached. She spied a rabbit hopping across a field, and couldn't help but think that she ought to be pointing it out to someone else, someone small. She travelled to Kent to spend Christmas with her family, but when night fell, and all of her nieces and nephews were tucked into bed, she felt too alone, and all she could think was that her life was passing her by, and if she didn't do something soon, she'd die this way, alone. Not unhappy. She wasn't that. Strangely enough, she'd grown into her widowhood and found a comfortable and contented pattern to her life. It was something she never would have believed possible during the awful months immediately following John's death. But she had, a bit through trial and error, found a place for herself in the world, and with it a small measure of peace. She enjoyed her life as Countess of Kilmartin. Michael had never married, so she retained the duties as well as the title. She loved Kilmartin, and she ran it with no interference from Michael. His instructions upon leaving the country four years earlier had been that she should manage the earldom as she saw fit, and once the shock of his departure had worn off, she'd realised that that had been the most precious gift he could have bestowed upon her. It had given her something to do, something to work toward, a reason to stop staring at the ceiling. She had friends, and she had family, both Stirling and Bridgerton, and she had a full life, in Scotland and London, where she spent several months of each year. So she should have been happy. And she was, mostly. She just wanted a baby. It had taken some time to admit this to herself. It was a desire that seemed somewhat disloyal to John. It wouldn't be his baby, after all. And even now, with him gone four years, it was difficult to imagine a child without his features woven across its face. And it meant, first and foremost, that she'd have to remarry. She'd have to change her name and pledge her troth to another man, to vow to make him first in her heart and her loyalties. And while the thought of that no longer struck pain in her heart, it seemed, well, strange. But she supposed there were some things a woman simply had to get past, and one cold February day, as she was staring out a window at Kilmartin, watching the snow slowly wrap a shroud around the tree branches, she realised that this was one of them. There were a lot of things in life to be afraid of, but strangeness ought not be among them. And so she decided to pack her things and head down to London a bit early this year. She generally spent the season in town, enjoying time with her family, shopping and attending musicals, taking in plays and doing all the things that simply weren't available in the Scottish countryside. But this season would be different. She needed a new wardrobe for one. She'd been out of mourning for some time, but she hadn't completely shrugged off the greys and lavenders of half-mourning, and she certainly hadn't paid the attention to fashion that a woman in her new position ought. It was time to wear blue. Bright, beautiful cornflower blue.
It had been her favourite colour years ago, and she'd been vain enough that she'd worn it fully, expecting people to comment on how it matched her eyes. She'd buy blue, and yes, pink and yellow as well, and maybe even... Something in her heart shivered with anticipation at the thought. Crimson. She wasn't an unmarried miss this time around. She was an eligible widow, and the rules were different. But the aspirations were the same. She was going to London to find herself a husband. It had been too long. Michael knew that his return to Britain was well overdue, but it had been one of those things that was appallingly easy to put off. According to his mother's letters, which had found him with remarkable regularity, the earldom was thriving under Francesca's stewardship. He had no dependents who might accuse him of neglect, and by all accounts, everyone he'd left behind was faring rather better in his absence than they had when he'd been around to cheer them on. So there was nothing to feel guilty about. But a man could only run from his destiny for so long, and as he marked his third year in the tropics, he had to admit that the novelty of an exotic life had worn off, and, to be completely frank, he was growing rather sick of the climate. India had given him a purpose, a place in life that went beyond the only two things at which he'd ever excelled, soldiering and making merry. He'd boarded a ship with nothing but the name of an army friend who'd moved to Madras three years earlier. Within a month, he'd obtained a governmental post and found himself making decisions that mattered, implementing laws and policies that actually shaped the lives of men. For the first time, Michael finally understood why John had been so enamoured of his work in the British Parliament. But India hadn't made him happy. It had given him a small measure of peace, which seemed rather paradoxical, since in the past few years he'd nearly met his demise three times, for, if one counted that run-in with the knife-wielding Indian princess, Michael still maintained that he could have disarmed her without injury, but she did, he had to admit, have a rather murderous look in her eye, and he'd long since learned that one should never, ever underestimate a woman who believes— however erroneously, herself scorned. Life-threatening episodes aside, however, his time in India had brought him a certain sense of balance. He'd finally done something for himself, made something of himself. But most of all, India had brought him peace because he didn't have to live with the constant knowledge that Francesca was just around the corner. Life wasn't necessarily better with thousands of miles between him and Francesca, but it certainly was easier. It was past time, however, to face up to the rigours of having her in close proximity. And so he'd packed up his belongings, informed his rather relieved valet that they were going back to England, booked a luxurious starboard suite on the Princess Amelia, and headed home. He'd have to face her, of course— there was no escaping that. He would have to look into the blue eyes that had haunted him relentlessly and try to be her friend. It was the one thing she'd wanted during the dark days after John's death, and it had been the only thing he had been completely unable to do for her. But maybe now, with the benefit of time and the healing power of distance, he could manage it. He wasn't stupid enough to hope that she'd changed— that he'd see her and discover he no longer loved her, that, he was quite certain, would never happen. But Michael had finally grown used to hearing the words Earl of Kilmartin without looking over his shoulder for his cousin. And maybe now, with the grief no longer so raw, he could be with Francesca in friendship, without feeling as if he were a thief, plotting to steal what he'd coveted for so long. And, hopefully, she, too, had moved on, and wouldn't ask him to fulfil John's duties in every way but one. But all the same, he was glad that it would be March when he disembarked in London, too early in the year for Francesca to have arrived for the season. He was a brave man. He'd proven that countless times, on and off the battlefield. But he was an honest man, too— honest enough to admit that the prospect of facing Francesca 
was terrifying in a way that no French battlefield or toothy tiger could ever be. Maybe, if he was lucky, she'd choose not to come down to London for the season at all. Wouldn't that be a boon? It was dark, and she couldn't sleep, and the house was miserably cold, and the worst of it was, it was all her fault. Oh, very well, not the dark. Francesca supposed she couldn't take the blame for that. Night was night after all, and she was rather overreaching to think that she had anything to do with the sun going down. But it was her fault that the household hadn't been given adequate time to prepare for her arrival. She'd forgotten to send notice that she was planning to come down to London a month early, and, as a result, Kilmartin House was still running with a skeleton staff, and the stores of coal and beeswax candles were perilously low. All would be better on the morrow, after the housekeeper and butler made a mad dash to the Bond Street shops. But for now, Francesca was shivering in her bed. It had been a miserably freezing day, with a blustery wind that made it far colder than was normal for early March. The housekeeper had attempted to move all the available coal to Francesca's grate, but, countess or no, she couldn't allow the rest of the household to freeze at her expense. Besides, the countess's bedchamber was immense, and it had always been difficult to heat properly unless the rest of the house was warm as well. The library. That was it. It was small and cosy, and if Francesca shut the door, a fire in its grate would keep the room nice and toasty. Furthermore, there was a settee on which she could lie. It was small, but then again, so was she, and it couldn't possibly be any worse than freezing to death in her bedroom. Her decision made, Francesca leapt out of bed and dashed through the cold night air to her nightrobe, which was lying across the back of a chair. It wasn't nearly warm enough. Francesca hadn't thought to need anything bulkier, but it was better than nothing, and she thought rather stoically, beggars couldn't be choosers, especially when their toes were falling off with cold. She hurried downstairs, her heavy wool socks slipping and sliding on the polished steps. She tumbled down the last two, thankfully landing on her feet, then ran along the runner carpet to the library. Fire! 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 she mumbled to herself. She'd ring for someone just as soon as she got to the library. They'd have a blaze roaring in no time. She'd regain feeling in her nose. Her fingertips would lose that sickly blue colour, and she pushed open the door. A short staccato scream hurled itself across her lips. There was already a fire in the grate, and a man standing in front of it, idly warming his hands. Francesca reached wildly for something, anything that she might use as a weapon. And then he turned. Michael? He hadn't known she'd be in London. Damn it, he hadn't even considered that she might be in London. Not that it would have made any difference, but at least he'd have been prepared. He might have schooled his features into a saturnine smirk, or at the very least made sure that he was impeccably dressed and wholeheartedly immersed in his role as the unrecoverable rake. But no, there he was, just gaping at her, trying not to notice that she was wearing nothing but a dark crimson nightgown and dressing robe, so thin and sheer that he could see the outline of... He gulped. Don't look. Do not look. Michael, she whispered again. Francesca, he said, since he had to say something. What are you doing here? And that seemed to snap her into thought and motion. What am I doing here? she echoed. I'm not the one who's meant to be in India. What are you doing here? He shrugged carelessly. Thought it was time to come home. Couldn't you have written? To you? he asked, quirking a brow. It was, and was meant to be, a direct hit. She hadn't penned him a single letter during his travels. He had sent her three letters, but once it became apparent that she didn't plan to answer, 
He'd conducted the rest of his correspondence through his mother and John's. To anyone, she replied. Someone would have been here to greet you. You're here, he pointed out. She scowled at him. If we'd known you were coming, we would have readied the house for you. He shrugged again. The motion seemed to embody the image he desperately needed to convey. It's ready enough. She hugged her arms to her body, effectively blocking his view of her breasts, which she had to concede was probably for the best. Well, you might have written, she finally said, her voice hanging sharp in the night air. It would only have been courteous. Francesca, he said, turning slightly away from her, so that he could continue to rub his hands together by the fire. Do you have any idea how long it takes for mail to reach London from India? Five months, she answered promptly. Four, if the winds are kind. Damn it, she was right. Be that as it may, he said peevishly. By the time I decided to return, there was little use in attempting forward notice. The letter would have gone out on the same ship I did. Really? I thought the passenger vessels were slower than the ones that take the mail. He sighed, glancing at her over his shoulder. They all take the mail. And besides, does it really matter? For a moment, he thought she would answer in the affirmative. But then she said quietly, No, of course not. The important thing is that you're home. Your mother will be thrilled. He turned away so that she wouldn't see his humorless smile. Yes, he murmured. Of course. And I... She stopped, cleared her throat. I am delighted to have you back as well. She sounded as if she were trying very hard to convince herself of this, but Michael decided to play the gentleman for once and not point it out. Are you cold? he asked instead. Not very, she said. You're lying. Just a little. He stepped to the side, making room for her closer to the fire. When he didn't hear her move toward him, he motioned toward the empty space with his hand. I should go back to my room, she said. For God's sake, Francesca, if you're cold, just come to the fire. I won't bite. She gritted her teeth and stepped forward, joining him near the blaze. But she kept herself somewhat off to the side, maintaining a bit of distance between them. You look well, she said. As do you. It's been a long time. I know. Four years, I believe. Francesca swallowed, wishing this weren't so difficult. This was Michael, for heaven's sake. It wasn't supposed to be difficult. Yes, they'd parted badly, but that had been in the dark days immediately following John's death. They'd all been in pain then. Wounded animals, lashing out at anyone in their way. It was supposed to be different now. Heaven knew she'd thought of this moment often enough. Michael couldn't stay away forever. They'd all known that. But once her initial anger had passed, she'd rather hoped that when he did return, they'd be able to forget that anything unpleasant had ever passed between them. And be friends again. She needed that, more than she'd ever realised. Do you have any plans? she asked, mostly because the silence was too awful. For now, all I can think about is getting warm, he muttered. She smiled in spite of herself. It is exceptionally chilly for this time of year. I'd forgotten how damnably cold it can be here, he grumbled, rubbing his hands together briskly. One would think you'd never escape the memory of a Scottish winter, Francesca murmured. He turned to her then, a wry smile tilting one corner of his mouth. He'd changed, she realised. Oh, there were the obvious differences, the ones everyone would notice. He was tan, quite scandalously so, and his hair, always midnight black, now sported a few odd strands of silver. But there was more. He held his mouth differently, more tightly, if that made any sense, and his smooth, lanky grace seemed to have gone missing. He had always seemed so at ease, so comfortable in his skin, but now he was 
taut, strained. You'd think, he murmured, and she just looked at him blankly, having quite forgotten what he was replying to, until he added, I came home because I couldn't stand the heat any longer, and now here I am, ready to perish from the cold. It will be spring soon, she said. Ah, yes, spring, with its merely frigid winds as opposed to the icy ones of winter. She laughed at that, absurdly pleased to have anything to laugh about in his presence. The house will be better tomorrow, she said. I only just arrived this evening, and like you, I neglected to send advance notice. Mrs. Parrish assures me that the house will be restocked tomorrow. He nodded, then turned around to warm his back. What are you doing here? Me, he motioned to the empty room as if to make a point. I live here, she said. You usually don't come down until April. You know that. For a moment, he looked almost embarrassed. My mother's letters are remarkably detailed, he said. She shrugged, then inched a little closer to the fire. She ought not stand so near to him. But dash it, she was still rather cold, and her thin night-robe did little to ward off the chill. Is that an answer? he drawled. I just felt like it, she said insolently. Isn't that a lady's prerogative? He turned again, presumably to warm his side, and then he was facing her, and he seemed terribly close. She moved, just an inch or so. She didn't want him to realise she'd been made uncomfortable by his nearness, nor did she want to admit the very same thing to herself. I thought it was a lady's prerogative to change her mind, he said. It's a lady's prerogative to do anything she wants, Francesca said pertly. Touché, Michael murmured. He looked at her again, more closely this time. You haven't changed. Her lips parted. How can you say that? Because you look exactly as I remembered you. And then, devilishly, he motioned toward her revealing nightwear. Aside from your attire, of course. She gasped and stepped back, wrapping her arms more tightly around her body. It was a bit sick of him, but he was rather pleased with himself for having offended her. He'd needed her to step away, to move out of his reach. She was going to have to set the boundaries because he wasn't sure he'd prove up to the task. He'd been lying when he'd said she hadn't changed. There was something different about her, something entirely unexpected, something that shook him down to his very soul. It was a sense about her, all in his mind, really, but no less devastating. There was an air of availability, a horrible, torturous knowledge that John was gone, really, truly gone, and the only thing stopping Michael from reaching out and touching her was his own conscience. It was almost funny. Almost. And there she was, still without a clue, still completely unaware that the man standing next to her wanted nothing so much than to peel every layer of silk from her body and lay her down in front of the fire. He wanted to nudge her thighs apart sink himself into her, and he laughed grimly. Four years, it seemed, had done little to cool his inappropriate ardour. Michael? He looked over at her. What's so funny? Her question, that's what. <laughs> you wouldn't understand. Try me, she dared. Oh, I think not. Michael? She prodded. He turned to her and said with deliberate coolness, Francesca, there are some things you will never understand. Her lips parted, and for a moment she looked as if she'd been struck, and he felt as horrid as if he'd done so. That was a terrible thing to say, she whispered. He shrugged. You've changed, she said. The sad thing was, he hadn't, not in any of the ways that might have made his life easier to bear. He sighed, 
hating himself, because he couldn't bear to have her hate him. Forgive me, he said, running his hand through his hair. I'm tired, and I'm cold, and I'm an ass. She grinned at that, and for a moment they were transported back in time. It's all right, she said kindly, touching his upper arm. You've had a long journey. He sucked in his breath. She used to do this all the time, touch his arm in friendship, never in public, of course, and rarely, even when it had just been the two of them. John would have been there. John was always there, and it had always, always shaken him. But never so much as now. I need to go to bed, he mumbled. He was usually a master at hiding his unease, but he just hadn't been prepared to see her this evening, and beyond that, he was damned tired. She withdrew her hand. There won't be a room ready for you. You should take mine. I'll sleep here. No, he said, with far more force than he'd intended. I'll sleep here, or hell, he muttered, striding across the room to yank on the bell pull. What the devil was the point of being the bloody Earl of Kilmartin if you couldn't have a bedchamber readied at any hour of the night? Besides, ringing the bell would mean that a servant would arrive within minutes, which would mean that he would no longer be standing here alone with Francesca. It wasn't as if they hadn't been alone together before, but never at night, and never with her in her nightgown, and he yanked the cord again. Michael, she said, sounding almost amused. I'm sure they heard you the first time. Yes, well, it's been a long day, he said. Storm in the channel and all that. You'll have to tell me of your travels soon, she said gently. He looked over at her, lifting a brow. I would have written to you of them. Her lips pursed for a moment. It was an expression he'd seen countless times on her face. She was choosing her words, deciding whether or not to spear him with her legendary wit. And apparently she decided against it, because instead she said, I was rather angry with you for leaving. He sucked in his breath. Trust Francesca to choose stark honesty over a scathing retort. I'm sorry, he said, and he meant it, even though he wouldn't have changed any of his actions. He'd needed to leave. He'd had to leave. Maybe it meant he was a coward. Maybe it meant he'd been less of a man. But he hadn't been ready to be the Earl. He wasn't John. Could never be John. And that was the one thing everyone had seemed to want of him. Even Francesca, in her own halfway sort of manner. He looked at her. He was quite sure she still didn't understand why he'd left. She probably thought she did. But how could she? She didn't know that he loved her, couldn't possibly understand how damned guilty he felt at assuming John's life. But none of that was her fault. And as he looked at her, standing fragile and proud as she stared at the fire, he said it again. I'm sorry. She acknowledged his apology with the barest hint of a nod. I should have written to you, she said. She turned to him then, her eyes filled with sorrow, and perhaps a hint of their own apology. But the truth was, I just didn't feel like it. Thinking of you made me think of John, and I suppose I needed not to think of him so much just then. Michael didn't pretend to understand, but he nodded nonetheless. She smiled wistfully. We had such fun, the three of us, didn't we? He nodded again. I miss him he said, and he was surprised by how good it felt to voice that. I always thought it would be so lovely when you finally married, Francesca added. You would have chosen someone brilliant and fun, I'm sure. What grand times the four of us would have had. Michael coughed. It seemed the best course of action. She looked up, broken from her reverie. Are you catching a chill? Probably. I'll be at death's door by Saturday, I'm sure. She arched a brow. I hope you don't expect me to nurse you. Just the opening he needed to move their banter back to where he felt most comfortable. Not necessary, he said with a wave of his hand. 
I shouldn't need more than three days to attract a bevy of unsuitable women to attend to my every need. Her lips pinched slightly, but she was clearly amused. The same as ever, I see. He gave her a lopsided grin. No one ever really changes, Francesca. She cocked her head to the side, motioning to the hall, where they could hear someone moving toward them on swift feet. The footman arrived, and Francesca took care of everything, allowing Michael to do nothing but stand by the fire, looking vaguely imperial as he nodded his agreement. Good night, Michael, she said, once the footman had left to do her bidding. Good night, Francesca, he said softly. It's good to see you again, she said, and then, as if she needed to convince one of them of it, he wasn't sure which, she added. It truly is. Chapter 6 I'm sorry I haven't written. No, that's not true. I'm not sorry. I don't wish to write. I don't wish to think of... From the Countess of Kilmartin to the new Earl of Kilmartin, one day after the receipt of his first missive to her, torn to bits, then soaked with tears. By the time Michael arose the next morning, Kilmartin House seemed to be back up and running as befitted the home of an earl. There were fires in every grate, and a splendid breakfast had been laid out in the informal dining room, with coddled eggs, ham, bacon, sausage, toast with butter and marmalade, and his own personal favourite, broiled mackerel. Francesca, however, was nowhere to be found. When he inquired after her, he was given a folded note she'd left for him earlier that morning. It seemed she felt that tongues might wag at their living alone together at Kilmartin House, and so she had removed herself to her mother's residence at No. 5 Bruton Street, until either Janet or Helen arrived down from Scotland. She did, however, invite him to call upon her that day, as she was certain they had much to discuss. And Michael supposed she was right. So once he'd finished with his breakfast, finding much to his great surprise that he rather missed the yogurts and doses of his Indian morning meal, he stepped outside and made his way to number five. He elected to walk. It wasn't very far, and the air had warmed appreciably since the icy gusts of the day before. But mostly, he just wanted to take in the cityscape, to remind himself of the rhythms of London. He'd never noticed the particular smells and sounds of the capital before. How the clip-clop of horses' hooves combined with the festive shout of the flower-seller and low rumble of cultured voices. There was the sound of his feet on the pavement and smell of roasting nuts and the vague heft of soot in the air, all combining to make something that was uniquely London. It was almost overpowering, which was strange, because he remembered feeling precisely the same way upon landing in India four years earlier. The humid air, redolent with spice and flowers, had shocked his every sense. It had felt almost like an assault, leaving him drowsy and disoriented. And while his reaction to London wasn't quite that dramatic, he still felt rather like the odd man out, his senses buffeted by smells and sounds that shouldn't have felt so unfamiliar. Had he become a stranger in his own land? It seemed almost bizarre. And yet, as he walked along the crowded streets of London's most exclusive shopping district, he couldn't help but think that he stood out, that anyone glancing upon him must instantly know that he was different, removed from their very British existence. Or, he allowed, as he caught sight of his reflection in a shop window, it could be the tan. It would take weeks to fade, months, maybe. His mother was going to be scandalised. The thought of it made him grin. He rather enjoyed scandalising his mother. He'd never be so grown up that that ceased to be fun. He turned on Bruton Street and walked past the last few homes to number five. He'd been there before, of course. Francesca's mother had always defined the word family in the widest of all possible manners, so Michael had found himself invited, along with John and Francesca, to any number of Bridgerton family events. When he arrived, 
Lady Bridgerton was already in the green and cream drawing room, taking a cup of tea at her writing desk under the window. Michael! she exclaimed, rising to her feet with obvious affection. How good to see you! Lady Bridgerton, he said, taking her hand and gracing it with a gallant kiss. No one does that like you, she said approvingly. One has to cultivate one's best manoeuvres, he murmured. And I can't tell you how much we ladies of a certain age appreciate your doing so. A certain age being... He smiled devilishly. One and thirty. Lady Bridgerton was the sort of woman who grew lovelier with age, but the smile she gave him made her positively radiant. You are always welcome in this house, Michael Sterling. He grinned and sat in a high-backed chair when she motioned for him to do so. Oh, dear, she said with a slight frown. I must apologise. I suppose I should be calling you Kilmartin now. Michael is just fine, he assured her. I know that it's been four years, she continued, but as I haven't seen you... You may call me anything you wish, he said smoothly. It was strange. He'd finally grown used to being called Kilmartin, adapted to the way his title had overtaken his surname. But that had been in India, where no one had known him as plain Mr. Sterling, and perhaps more importantly... No one had known John as the Earl. Hearing his title on Violet Bridgerton's lips was a little unnerving, especially since she had, as was the custom for many mothers-in-law, habitually referred to John as her son. But if she sensed any of his inner discomfort, she gave no indication. If you are going to be so accommodating, she said, then I must be as well. Please do call me Violet. It's well past time that you did. Oh, I couldn't, he said quickly, and he meant it. This was Lady Bridgerton. She was, well, he didn't know what she was, but she couldn't possibly be violet to him. I insist, Michael, she said, and I'm certain you're already aware that I usually get my way. There was no way he was going to win the argument, so he just sighed and said, I don't know if I can kiss the hand of a violet. It seems rather scandalously intimate, don't you think? Don't you dare stop. Tongues will wag, he warned her. I believe my reputation can withstand it. Ah, but can mine? She laughed. You are a rascal. He leaned back in his chair. It serves me well. Would you care for tea? She motioned to the delicate china pot on the desk across the room. Mine has gone cold, but I would be happy to ring for more. I'd love some, he admitted. I suppose you're spoiled for it now, after so many years in India, she said, standing and crossing the room to ring the bell pull. It's just not the same, he said, quickly rising to his feet as well. I can't explain it, but nothing tastes quite like tea in England. The quality of the water, do you think? He smiled stealthily. The quality of the woman pouring. She laughed. You, my lord, need a wife. Immediately. Oh, really? And why is that? Because in your present state, you are clearly a danger to unmarried women everywhere. He couldn't resist one last flirtation. I hope you are including yourself in those ranks, Violet and then a voice from the door. Are you flirting with my mother? It was Francesca, of course, impeccably turned out in a lavender morning dress adorned with a rather intricate stretch of Belgian lace. She looked as if she were very much trying to be stern with him, and not entirely succeeding. Michael allowed his lips to curve into a mysterious smile as he watched the two ladies take their seats. I have travelled the world over, Francesca, and can say without qualification that there are few women with whom I'd rather flirt than your mother. I am inviting you to supper right now, Violet announced, and I will not accept no for an answer. Michael chuckled. I'd be honoured. Across from him, Francesca murmured, You are incorrigible. He just flashed her a lanky grin. This was good, he decided, 
the morning was proceeding exactly as he'd hoped, with he and Francesca falling into their old roles and habits. He was once again the reckless charmer, and she was pretending to scold him, and all was as it had been back before John had died. He'd been surprised last night. He hadn't expected to see her, and he hadn't been able to make sure that his public persona was firmly in place. And it wasn't as if it all was an act. He'd always been a bit reckless, and he probably was an irredeemable flirt. His mother certainly liked to say that he'd been charming the ladies since the age of four. It was just that when he was with Francesca, it was vitally important that that aspect of his personality remained at the forefront, so that she never suspected what lay underneath. "'What are your plans now that you are returned?' Violet asked. Michael turned to her, with what he knew had to be a blank expression. "'I'm not certain, actually,' he said, ashamed to admit to himself that that was true. "'I imagine it will take me some time to understand just what exactly is expected of me in my new role.' "'I'm sure Francesca can be of help in that quarter,' Violet said. "'Only if she wishes it,' Michael said quietly. "'Of course.' Francesca said, moving slightly to the side when a maid came in with a tea tray. I will assist you in any way you need. That was rather quick, Michael murmured. I'm mad for tea, Violet explained. Drink it all day long. The maids keep water to near boiling on the stove at all times now. Will you have some? Francesca asked, since she had taken charge of pouring. Yes, thank you, Michael replied. "'No one knows Kill Martin as Francesca does,' Violet said, with all the pride of a mother hen. "'She will prove invaluable to you.' "'I am quite sure that you are correct,' Michael said, accepting a cup from Francesca. She had remembered how he took it. Milk, no sugar. For some reason, this pleased him immensely. "'She has been the Countess for six years, and for four of them she has had to be the Earl as well.' At Francesca's startled glance, he added, In every way but in name. Oh, come now, Francesca, you must realise that it is true. I, and, he added, that it is a compliment. I owe you a greater debt than I could ever repay. I could not have stayed away so long had I not known that the earldom was in such capable hands. Francesca actually blushed, which surprised him, in all the years he'd known her, he could count on one hand the times he had seen her cheeks go pink. Thank you, she mumbled. It was no difficulty, I assure you. Perhaps, but it is appreciated all the same. He lifted his teacup to his lips, allowing the ladies to direct the conversation from there, which they did. Violet asked him about his time in India, and before he knew it, he was telling them of palaces and princesses, caravans and curries. He left out the marauders and malaria, and deciding they weren't quite the thing for a drawing-room conversation. After a while, he realised that he was enjoying himself immensely. Maybe, he thought, reflecting on the moment, as Violet said something about an Indian-themed ball she'd attended the year before— just maybe he'd made the right decision. It might actually be good to be home. An hour later, Francesca found herself on Michael's arm, strolling through Hyde Park. The sun had broken through the clouds, and when she had declared that she could not resist the fine weather, Michael had had no choice but to offer to accompany her for a walk. "'It's rather like old times,' she said, tilting her face up toward the sun. She'd most likely end up with a ghastly tan, or at the very least freckles. But she supposed she'd always look like pale porcelain next to Michael, whose skin marked him immediately as a recent returnee from the tropics. Walking, you mean? he asked. Or you're expertly manoeuvring me into accompanying you? She tried to maintain a straight face. Both, of course. You used to take me out a great deal, whenever John was busy. So I did. They walked on in silence for a few moments, and then he said, 
I was a bit surprised to find you gone this morning. I hope you understand why I had to leave, she said. I didn't want to, of course. Returning to my mother's home makes me feel as if I'm stepping right back into childhood. She felt her lips pinching together in distaste. I adore her, of course, but I've grown rather used to maintaining my own household. Would you like me to take up residence elsewhere? No, of course not, she said quickly. You are the Earl. Kilmartin House belongs to you. Besides, Helen and Janet are only a week behind me. They should arrive soon, and then I will be able to move back in. Chin up, Francesca. I am sure you will endure. She shot him a sideways glance. It is nothing that you, or any man for that matter, will understand, but I much prefer my status as a married woman to that of a debutante. When I'm at number five, with both Eloise and Hyacinth in residence, I feel as if I'm back in my first season, with all the attendant rules and regulations. Not all of them, he pointed out. If that were true, you'd not be allowed out with me right now. True, she acceded. Especially with you, I imagine. And just what is that supposed to mean? She laughed. Oh, come now, Michael. Did you really think that your reputation would find itself whitewashed just because you left the country for four years? Francesca! You're a legend! He looked aghast. It's true, she said, wondering why he was so surprised. Goodness, women are still talking about you. Not to you, I hope, he muttered. Oh, to me above all others. She grinned wickedly. They all want to know when you plan to return, and it's sure to be worse once word gets out that you're back. I must say, it's rather an odd role, confidant to London's most notorious rake. Confidant, eh? What else would you call it? No, no. Confidant is a perfectly appropriate word. It's just that if you think I've confided everything in you... Francesca shot him a cross expression. This was so like him, letting his words trail off meaningfully, leaving her imagination feverish with questions. I take it, then, she muttered, that you did not share with us all the news from India? He just smiled. Devilishly. Very well. Allow me, then, to move the conversation to more respectable areas. What do you plan to do, now that you are back? Will you take up your seat in Parliament? He appeared not to have considered that. It is what John would have wanted, she said, knowing that she was being fiendishly manipulative. Michael looked at her grimly, and his eyes told her that he did not appreciate her tactics. You will have to marry as well, Francesca said. Do you plan to take on the role of my matchmaker? he asked peevishly. She shrugged. If you desire it, I'm sure I couldn't possibly do a worse job of it than you. Good God, he grumbled. I've been back one day. Do we need to address this now? No, of course not, she allowed. But soon, you're not getting any younger. Michael just stared at her in shock. I can't imagine permitting anyone else to speak to me in such a manner. Don't forget your mother, she said, with a satisfied smile. You, he said rather forcefully, are not my mother. Thank heavens for that, she returned. I'd have expired of heart failure years ago. I don't know how she does it. He actually halted in his tracks. I'm not that bad, she shrugged delicately. Aren't you? And he was speechless absolutely speechless. It was a conversation they'd had countless times, but something was different now. There was an edge to her voice, a jab to her words that had never quite been there before. Or maybe it was just that he'd never noticed it. Oh, don't look so shocked, Michael, she said, reaching across her body and patting him lightly on the arm. Of course you have a terrible reputation, but you are endlessly charming, and so you are always forgiven. Was this how she saw him, he wondered, and why was he surprised? It was exactly the image he'd cultivated. And now that you are the Earl, she continued, 
the mamas shall be falling all over themselves to pair you with their precious daughters. I feel afraid, he said under his breath. Very afraid. You should, she said, with no sympathy whatsoever. It will be a feeding frenzy, I assure you. You were fortunate that I took my mother aside this morning and made her swear not to throw Eloise or Hyacinth in your path. She would do it, too, she added, clearly relishing the conversation. I seem to recall that you used to find joy in throwing your sisters in my path. Her lips twisted slightly. That was years ago, she said, swishing her hand through the air, as if she could wave his words away on the wind. You would never suit. He'd never had any desire to court either of her sisters, but nor could he resist the chance to give Francesca a wee verbal poke. Eloise, he queried. Or Hyacinth? Neither, she replied, with enough testiness to make him smile. But I shall find you someone. Do not fret. Was I fretting? She went on as if he hadn't spoken. I think I shall introduce you to Eloise's friend, Penelope. Miss Featherington? he asked, vaguely recalling a slightly pudgy girl who never spoke. She's my friend as well, of course, Francesca added. I believe you might like her. As she learned to speak, she glared at him. I'm going to ignore that comment. Penelope is a perfectly lovely and highly intelligent lady, once one gets past her initial shyness. And how long does that take? he muttered. I think she would balance you quite nicely, Francesca declared. Francesca, he said, somewhat forcefully, you will not play matchmaker for me. Is that understood? Well, some... And don't you say that someone has to... He cut in. Really, she was the same open book she'd been years ago. She'd always wanted to manage his life. Michael, she said, the word coming out as a sigh that was far more long-suffering than she had a right to be. I have been back in town for one day, he said. One day. I am tired, and I don't care if the sun is out. I'm still bloody cold, and my belongings haven't even been unpacked. Pray give me at least a week before you start planning my wedding. A week, then, she said slyly. Francesca, he said, his voice laced with warning. Very well, she said dismissively, but don't you dare say I didn't warn you. Once you are out in society, and the young ladies have you backed into a corner with their mamas coming in for the kill. He shuddered at the image, and at the knowledge that her prediction was probably correct. You will be begging for my help, she finished, looking up at him with a rather annoyingly satisfied expression. I'm sure I will, he said, giving her a paternalistic smile that he knew she'd detest. And when that happens, I promise you that I shall be duly prostrate with regretfulness, atonement, shamefacedness, and any other unpleasant emotion you care to assign to me. And then she laughed, which warmed his heart far more than he should have let it. He could always make her laugh. She turned to him and smiled, then patted his arm. It's good to have you back. It's good to be back, he said. He'd said the words automatically, but he realised he'd meant them. It was good. Difficult, but good. But even difficult wasn't worth complaining over. It was certainly nothing he wasn't used to. They were fairly deep in Hyde Park now, and the grounds were growing a bit more crowded. The trees were only just beginning to bud, but the air was still nippy enough that the people out strolling weren't looking for shade. I should have brought bread for the birds, Francesca murmured. At the serpentine, Michael asked with surprise. He'd often walked in Hyde Park with Francesca, and they had tended to avoid that area of the serpentine's banks like the plague. It was always full of nursemaids and children. Shrieking like little savages, often the nursemaids more so than the children, and Michael had at least one acquaintance who had found himself pelted in the head with a loaf of bread. Seems no one had told the budding little cricket player that one was supposed to break the bread into more manageable and less hazardous segments.
I like to toss bread in for the birds, Francesca said, a touch defensively. Besides, there won't be too many children about today. It's still a bit cold yet. Never stopped John and me, Michael offered gamely. Yes, well, you're Scottish, she returned. Your blood circulates quite well, half-frozen. He grinned. A hearty lot, we Scots. It was a bit of a joke, that. With so much intermarriage, the family was at least as much English as it was Scottish. Perhaps even more so. But with Kilmartin firmly situated in the border counties, the Stirlings clung to their Scottish heritage like a badge of honour. They found a bench not too far from the Serpentine and sat, idly watching the ducks on the water. You'd think they'd find a warmer spot, Michael said. France, maybe. And miss out on all the food the children toss at them. Francesca smiled wryly. They're not stupid. He just shrugged. Far be it from him to pretend any great knowledge of avian behaviour. How did you find the climate in India? Francesca queried. Is it as hot as they say? More so, he replied. Or maybe not. I don't know. I imagine the descriptions are perfectly accurate. The problem is, no Englishman can truly understand what they mean until he gets there. She looked at him quizzically. It's hotter than you could ever imagine, he said, spelling it out. It sounds... well... I don't know how it sounds, she admitted. The heat isn't nearly so difficult as the insects. It sounds dreadful, Francesca decided. You probably wouldn't like it. Not for an extended stay, anyway. I'd like to travel, though, she said softly. I'd always planned to. She fell silent, nodding in a rather absent-minded manner her chin tilting up and down for so long that he was quite sure she'd forgotten she was doing it. Then he realised that her eyes were fixed off in the distance. She was watching something, but for the life of him, he couldn't imagine what. There was nothing interesting in the vista, just a pinch-faced nursemaid pushing a pram. "'What are you looking at?' he finally asked. She said nothing, just continued to stare. Francesca. She turned to him. I want a baby. Chapter 7 Had hoped to have received a note from you by now, but of course the post is notoriously unreliable when it must travel so far. Just last week I heard tale of the arrival of a mail pouch that was a full two years old, Many of the recipients had already returned to England. My mother writes that you are well and fully recovered from your ordeal. I am glad to hear of it. My work here continues to challenge and fulfil. I have taken up residence outside the city proper, as do most Europeans here in Madras. Nonetheless, I enjoy visiting the city. It is rather Grecian in appearance, or rather what I must imagine is Grecian, having never visited that country myself. The sky is blue, so blue it is nearly blinding, almost the bluest thing I have ever seen. From the Earl of Kilmartin to the Countess of Kilmartin, six months after his arrival in India. I beg your pardon? She'd shocked him. He was sputtering even, she hadn't made her announcement to elicit this sort of reaction, but now that he was sitting there, his mouth hanging open and slack, she couldn't help but take a small amount of pleasure from the moment. I want a baby, she said with a shrug. Is there something surprising in that? His lips moved before he actually made sound. Well, no, but... I'm twenty-six. I know how old you are he said, a little testily. I'll be twenty-seven at the end of April. I don't think it's so odd that I might want a child. His eyes still held a vaguely glazed sort of quality. No, of course not, but... And I shouldn't have to explain myself to you. I wasn't asking you to, he said, staring at her as if she'd grown two heads. I'm sorry, she mumbled. 
I overreacted. He said nothing, which irritated her. At the very least, he could have contradicted her. It would have been a lie, but it was still the kind and courteous thing to do. Finally, because the silence was simply unbearable, she muttered, A lot of women want children. Right, he said, coughing on the word. Of course. But don't you think you might want a husband first? Of course. She speared him with an aggravated glare. Why do you think I came down to London early? He looked at her blankly. I am shopping for a husband, she said, speaking to him as if he were a half-wit. How mercenarily put, he murmured. She pursed her lips. It's what it is, and you had probably best get used to it for your own sake. It's precisely how the ladies will soon be talking about you. He ignored the latter part of her statement. Do you have a particular gentleman in mind? She shook her head. Not yet. I imagine someone will pop to the forefront once I start looking, though. She was trying to sound jolly about it, but the truth was, her voice was dropping in both tone and volume. I'm sure my brothers have friends, she finally mumbled. He looked at her, then slumped back slightly and stared at the water. I've shocked you, she said. Well, yes. Normally I'd take great pleasure in that, she said, her lips twisting ironically. He didn't reply, but he did roll his eyes slightly. I can't mourn John forever, she said. I mean, I can, and I will, but... She stopped, hating that she was near tears. And the worst part of it is, maybe I can't even have children. It took me two years to conceive with John... And look how I mucked that up. Francesca, he said fiercely, you mustn't blame yourself for the miscarriage. She let out a bitter laugh. <laughs> Can you imagine marrying someone just so I could have a baby and then not having one? It happens to people all the time, he said softly. It was true, but it didn't make her feel any better. She had a choice. She didn't have to marry. She would be quite well provided for, and blessedly independent, if she remained a widow. If she married, no, when she married, she had to mentally commit to the idea. It wouldn't be for love. She wasn't going to have a marriage like the one she'd shared with John. A woman simply didn't find love like that twice in a lifetime. She was going to marry for a baby, and there was no guarantee that she would get one. Francesca. She didn't look at him, just sat there and blinked, desperately trying to ignore the tears burning at the corners of her eyes. Michael held out a handkerchief, but she didn't want to acknowledge the gesture. If she took the cloth, then she'd have to cry. There would be nothing stopping her. I must move on, she said defiantly. I must. John is gone, and I... And then the strangest thing happened. Except strange wasn't really the right word. Shocking, perhaps, or altering. Or maybe there wasn't a word for the type of surprise that stole the pulse from one's body, leaving one immobile, unable to breathe. She turned to him. It should have been a simple thing. She'd certainly turned to Michael before. Hundreds, no, thousands of times. He might have spent the last four years in India, but she knew his face, and she knew his smile. In truth, she knew everything about him. Except this time was different. She turned to him, but she hadn't expected him to have already turned to her, and she hadn't expected him to be so close that she'd see the charcoal flecks in his eyes. But most of all, she hadn't expected her gaze to drop to his lips. They were full and lush and finely moulded, and she knew the shape as well as the shape of her own. Except never before had she really looked at them, noticed the way they weren't quite uniform in colour, or how the curve of his lower lip was really quite sensual. And she stood, so quickly that she nearly lost her balance. I have to go she said, 
stunned that her voice sounded like her own and not some freakish demon. I have an appointment. I'd forgotten. Of course, he said, standing beside her. With the dressmaker, she added, as if details would make her lie more convincing. All my clothes are in half morning colours. He nodded. They don't suit you. Kind of you to point it out, she said testily. You should wear blue, he said. She nodded jerkily, still off balance and out of sorts. Are you all right? he asked. I'm fine, she bit off. And then, because no one would ever have been fooled by her tone, she added, more carefully, I'm fine, I assure you. I simply detest being tardy. That much was true, and he knew it of her. So hopefully he'd accept it as reason for her snappishness. Very well, he said congenially, and Francesca chattered all the way back to number five. She had to put up a good front, she realised rather feverishly. She couldn't possibly allow him to guess what had really transpired within her on the bench by the serpentine. She had known, of course, that Michael was handsome, even startlingly so, but it had all been an abstract sort of knowledge. Michael was handsome, just as her brother Benedict was tall, and her mother had beautiful eyes. But suddenly, but now, she'd looked at him, and she'd seen something entirely new. She'd seen a man, and it scared the very devil out of her. Francesca tended to subscribe to the notion that the best course of action was more action, so when she returned to number five after her stroll, she sought out her mother and informed her that she needed to visit the modiste immediately, best to make truth out of her lie as soon as possible after all. Her mother was only too delighted to see Francesca out of her half-morning greys and lavenders, and so barely an hour passed before the two of them were comfortably ensconced in Violet's elegant carriage, on their way to the exclusive shops on Bond Street. Normally, Francesca would have bristled at Violet's interference. She was perfectly capable of picking out her own wardrobe, thank you very much. But today she found her mother's presence oddly comforting. Not that her mother wasn't usually a comfort, just that Francesca tended to favour her independent streak more often than not, and she rather preferred not to be thought of as one of those Bridgerton girls. And in a very strange way, this trip to the dressmaker was rather discomforting. It would have required full-fledged torture to get her to admit it, but Francesca was, quite simply, terrified. Even if she hadn't decided it was time to remarry, shrugging off her widow's weeds signalled a huge change, and not one she was entirely sure she was ready for. She looked down at her sleeve as she sat in the carriage. She couldn't see the fabric of her dress. It was covered by her coat, but she knew that it was lavender, and there was something comforting in that, something solid and dependable. She'd worn that colour, or grey in its place, for three years now, and unrelenting black for a year before that. It had been a bit of a badge, she realised, a uniform of sorts. One never had to worry about who one was when one's clothing proclaimed it so loudly. Mother, she said, before she even realised that she had a question to ask. Violet turned to her with a smile. Yes, dear. Why did you never remarry? Violet's lips parted slightly, and to Francesca's great surprise, her eyes grew bright. Do you know, Violet said softly, this is the first time any of you has asked me that. That can't be true, Francesca said. Are you certain? Violet nodded. None of my children has asked me. I would have remembered. No, no, of course you would, Francesca said quickly. But it was all so odd and unthinking, really. Why would no one have asked Violet about this? It seemed to Francesca quite the most burning question imaginable, and even if none of Violet's children had cared about the answer for their own personal curiosity, didn't they realise how important it was to Violet? Didn't they want to know their mother? 
truly know her? When your father died, Violet said, well, I don't know how much you recall, but it was very sudden. None of us expected it. She gave a sad little laugh, and Francesca wondered if she'd ever be able to laugh about John's death, even if it was tinged with grief. A bee sting, Violet continued, and Francesca realised that even now, more than twenty years after Edmund Bridgerton's death, her mother still sounded surprised when she talked about it. Who would have thought it possible? Violet said, shaking her head. I don't know how well you remember him, but your father was a very large man, as tall as Benedict, and perhaps even broader in the shoulders. You just wouldn't think that a bee... She stopped, pulling out a crisp white handkerchief and holding it to her lips as she cleared her throat. Well, it was unexpected. I don't really know what else to say, except... She turned to her daughter with achingly wise eyes. Except, I imagine you understand better than anyone. Francesca nodded, not even trying to stem the burning sensation behind her eyes. Anyway, Violet said briskly, obviously eager to move forward. After his death, I was just so stunned... I felt as if I were walking in a haze. I'm not at all certain how I functioned that first year, or even the ones directly thereafter. So I couldn't possibly even think of marriage. I know, Francesca said softly, and she did. And after that, well, I don't know what happened. Maybe I just didn't meet anyone with whom I cared to share my life. Maybe I loved your father too much. She shrugged. Maybe I just never saw the need. I was in a very different position from you, after all. I was older, don't forget, and already the mother of eight children. And your father left our affairs in very good order. I knew we would never want for anything. John left Kilmartin in excellent order, Francesca said quickly. Of course he did, Violet said, patting her hand. Forgive me. I did not mean to imply otherwise. But you don't have eight children, Francesca. Her eyes changed somehow, grew an even deeper blue. And you've quite a lot of time ahead of you to spend it all alone. Francesca nodded jerkily. I know, she said. I know, I know. But I can't quite... I can't... You can't what? Violet asked gently. I can't. Francesca looked down. She didn't know why, but for some reason she couldn't take her eyes off the floor. I can't rid myself of the feeling that I'm doing something wrong, that I'm dishonouring John, dishonouring our marriage. John would have wanted you to be happy. I know, I know, of course he would. But don't you see? She looked up again her eyes searching her mother's face for something. She wasn't sure what. Maybe approval. Maybe just love, since there was something comforting in looking for something she already knew she'd find. I'm not even looking for that, she added. I'm not going to find someone like John. I've accepted that, and it feels so wrong to marry with less. You won't find someone like John. That is true, Violet said. But you might find a man who will suit you equally well, just in a different way. You didn't? No, I didn't, she agreed. But I didn't look very hard. I didn't look at all. Do you wish you had? Violet opened her mouth. But not a sound came out, not even breath. Finally, she said, I don't know, Francesca. I honestly don't know. And then, because the moment almost certainly needed a bit of laughter, she added, I certainly didn't want any more children. Francesca couldn't help but smile. I do, she said, softly. I want a baby. I thought that you did. Why did you never ask me about it? Violet tilted her head to the side. Why did you never ask me about why I never remarried? <laughs>
Francesca felt her lips part. She shouldn't have been so surprised by her mother's perceptiveness. If you had been Eloise, I think I would have said something, Violet added, or any of your sisters, for that matter. But you, she smiled nostalgically, you're not the same. You never have been. Even as a child you set yourself apart, and you needed your distance. Impulsively, Francesca reached out and squeezed her mother's hand. I love you. Did you know that? Violet smiled. I rather suspected it. Mother, very well. Of course I knew it. How could you not love me when I love you so very, very much? I haven't said it, Francesca said, feeling rather horrified by her omission. Not recently, anyway. It's quite all right. Violet squeezed her hand back. You've had other things on your mind. And for some reason, that made Francesca giggle under her breath. A bit of an understatement, I should say. Violet just grinned. Mother, Francesca blurted out, may I ask you one more question? Of course. If I don't find someone, not like John, of course, but still not equally suited to me, if I don't find someone like that, and I marry someone whom I rather like, but perhaps don't love, is that all right? Violet was silent for several moments before she answered. I'm afraid only you will know the answer to that, she finally said. I would never say no, of course. Half the ton, more than half, in truth, has marriages like that, and quite a few of them are perfectly content. But you will have to make your judgments for yourself when they arise. Everyone is different, Francesca. I suspect you know that better than most. And when a man asks for your hand, you will have to judge him on his merits, and not by some arbitrary standard you have set out ahead of time. She was right, of course, but Francesca was so sick of life being messy and complicated that it wasn't the answer she'd been seeking, and none of it addressed the problem that lay most deeply within her heart— what would happen if she actually did meet someone who made her feel the way she'd felt with John? She couldn't imagine that she would. Truly, it seemed wildly improbable. But what if she did? How could she live with herself then? There was something rather satisfying about a foul mood, so Michael decided to indulge his completely. He kicked a pebble all the way home, he snarled at anyone who jostled him on the street. He yanked open his front door with such ferocity that it slammed into the stone wall behind it. Or rather, he would have done if his sodding butler hadn't been so on his toes and had the door open before Michael's fingers could even touch the handle. But he thought about slamming it open, which provided some satisfaction in and of itself. And then he stomped up the stairs to his room, which still felt too bloody much like John's room, not that there was anything he could do about that just then, and he yanked off his boots, or tried to. Bloody hell! Rivers! he bellowed. His valet appeared, or really it seemed rather more like he apparated in the doorway. Yes, my lord. Would you help me with my boots? Michael ground out, feeling rather infantile. Three years in the army and four in India, and he couldn't remove his own damned boots. What was it about London that reduced a man to a snivelling idiot? He seemed to recall that Reavers had had to remove his boots for him the last time he'd lived in London as well. He looked down. They were different boots. Different styles, he supposed, for different situations— and Rivas had always taken a stunningly ridiculous pride in his work. Of course, he'd have wanted to outfit Michael in the very best of London fashion. He'd have... Rivas, Michael said in a low voice, where did you get these boots? My lord, these boots, I do not recognise them. We have not yet received all of your trunks from the ship, my lord. You didn't have anything suitable for London... So I located these among the previous holes belonged. Jesus! My lord, 
I'm terribly sorry if these don't suit you. I remembered that the two of you were of a size, and I thought you'd want... Just get them off. Now! Michael closed his eyes and sat in a leather chair, John's leather chair, marvelling at the irony of it. His worst nightmare coming true, in the most literal of fashions. Of course, my lord. Reavers looked pained, but he quickly went to work removing the boots. Michael pinched the bridge of his nose with his thumb and forefinger and let out a long breath before speaking again. I would prefer not to use any items from the previous Earl's wardrobe, he said wearily. Truly, he had no idea why John's clothing was still here. The lot of it should have been given to the servants or donated to charity years ago. But he supposed that was Francesca's decision to make, not his. Of course, my lord. I shall see to it immediately. Good, Michael grunted. Shall I have it locked away? Locked? Good God! It wasn't as if the stuff were toxic. I'm sure it is all just fine where it is, Michael said. Just don't use any of it for me. Right. Reavers swallowed, and his Adam's apple bobbed uncomfortably. What is it now, Reavers? It's just that all of the previous Lord Kilmartin's accoutrements are still here. Here? Michael asked blankly. Here? Reavers confirmed, glancing about the room. Michael sagged in his chair. It wasn't that he wanted to wipe every last reminder of his cousin off the face of this earth. No one missed John as much as he did. No one. Well, except maybe Francesca, he allowed. But that was different. But he just didn't know how he was meant to lead his life so completely and smotheringly surrounded by John's belongings. He held his title, spent his money, lived in his house. Was he meant to wear his damned shoes as well? Pack it all up, he said to Reavers. Tomorrow. I don't wish to be disturbed this evening. And besides, he probably ought to alert Francesca of his intentions. Francesca. He sighed, rising to his feet once the valet had departed. Christ! Reavers had forgotten to take the boots with him. Michael picked them up and deposited them outside the door. He was probably overreacting. But hell, he just didn't want to stare at John's boots for the next six hours. After shutting the door with a decisive click, he padded aimlessly over to the window. The sill was wide and deep, and he leaned heavily against it gazing through the sheer curtains at the blurry streetscape below. He pushed the thin fabric aside, his lips twisting into a bitter smile as he watched a nursemaid tugging a small child along the pavement. Francesca. She wanted a baby. He didn't know why he was so surprised. If he thought about it rationally, he really shouldn't have been. She was a woman, for God's sake. Of course she'd want children. Didn't they all? And while he'd never consciously sat down and told himself that she'd pine away for John forever, he'd also never considered the idea that she might actually care to remarry one day. Francesca and John. John and Francesca. They were a unit. Or at least they had been. And although John's death had made it sadly easy to envision one without the other, it was quite something else entirely to think of one with another. And then, of course, there was the small matter of his skin crawling, which was his general reaction to the thought of Francesca with another man. He shuddered. Or was that a shiver? Damn, he hoped it wasn't a shiver. He supposed he was simply going to have to get used to the notion. If Francesca wanted children, then Francesca needed a husband— and there wasn't a damned thing he could do about it. It would have been rather nice, he supposed, if she had come to this decision and taken care of the whole odious matter last year, sparing him the nausea of having to witness the entire courtship unfold. If she'd just gone and gotten herself married last year, then it would have been over and done with, and that would have been that. End of story. But now he was going to have to watch maybe even advise. Bloody hell!'
He shivered again. Damn. Maybe he was just cold. It was March, after all, and a chilly one at that, even with a fire in the grate. He tugged at his cravat, which was starting to feel unaccountably tight, then yanked it off altogether. Christ! He felt like the very devil, all hot and cold and queerly off balance. He sat down. It seemed the best course of action. And then he just gave up all pretense of being well, stripping off the rest of his clothing and crawling into bed. It was going to be a long night. Chapter 8 Wonderful, lovely, nice... Strike. Good to hear from you. I am glad you were faring well. John would have been proud. I miss you. Strike. I miss him. I miss you. Strike. Some of the flowers are still out. Isn't it nice that some of the flowers are still out? From the Countess of Kilmartin to the Earl of Kilmartin, one week after the receipt of his second missive to her. First draft. Never finished. Never sent. Didn't Michael say that he would be joining us for supper this evening? Francesca looked up at her mother, who was standing before her with concerned eyes. She had been thinking the exact same thing, actually, wondering what was keeping him. She'd spent the better part of the day dreading his arrival, even though he had absolutely no idea that she had been so distressed by that moment in the park. Good heavens! He probably didn't even realise there had been a moment. It was the first time in her life that Francesca was thankful for the general obtuseness of men. Yes, he did say that he would come, she replied, shifting slightly in her chair. She had been waiting for some time now in the drawing-room with her mother and two of her sisters, idly passing the time until their supper-guest arrived. Didn't we give him the time? Violet asked. Francesca nodded. I confirmed it with him when he left me here, after our stroll in the park. She was quite certain of the exchange. She clearly recalled feeling rather sick in her stomach when they had spoken of it. She hadn't wanted to see him again. Not so quickly, anyway. But what could she do? Her mother had issued the invitation. He's probably just running late, said Hyacinth, Francesca's youngest sister. I'm not surprised. His sort is always late. Francesca turned on her instantly. What is that supposed to mean? I've heard all about his reputation. What has his reputation to do with anything? Francesca asked testily. And anyway... What would you know of it? He left England years before you made your bow. Hyacinth shrugged, jabbing a needle into her extremely untidy embroidery. People still speak of him, she said carelessly. The ladies swoon like idiots at the mere mention of his name, if you must know. There's no other way to swoon, put in Eloise, who, although Francesca's elder by precisely one year, was still unmarried. Well, Rake he may be, Francesca said archly, but he has always been punctual to a fault. She never could countenance others speaking ill of Michael. She might sigh and moan and belabour his faults, but it was entirely unacceptable that Hyacinth, whose knowledge of Michael was based entirely on rumour and innuendo, would make such a sweeping judgment. Believe what you will, Francesca said sharply, because there was no way she was going to allow Hyacinth to have the last word. But he would never be late to a supper here. He holds Mother in far too high regard. What about his regard for you? Hyacinth said. Francesca glared at her sister, who was smirking into her embroidery. He... No, she wasn't going to do this. She wasn't going to sit here and get into an argument with her younger sister... Not when something might actually be wrong. Michael was, for all his wicked ways, faultlessly polite and considerate to the bone, or at least he had always been so in her presence, and he would never have arrived for supper, she glanced up at the mantel clock, over thirty minutes late, 
not at least without sending word. She stood, briskly smoothing down her dull grey skirts. I am going to kill Martin House, she announced. By yourself? Violet asked. By myself, Francesca said firmly. It is my home after all. I hardly think that tongues will wag if I stop by for a quick visit. Yes, yes, of course, her mother said. But don't stay too long. Mother, I am a widow, and I do not plan to spend the night. I merely intend to inquire as to Michael's welfare. I shall be just fine, I assure you. Violet nodded, but from her expression, Francesca could see that she would have liked to have said more. It had been like this for years. Violet wanted to resume her role of mother hen to her young widowed daughter, but she held back, attempting to respect her independence. She didn't always manage to resist interfering, but she tried, and Francesca was grateful for the effort. Do you want me to accompany you? Hyacinth asked, her eyes lighting up. No, Francesca said, surprise making her tone a bit more vehement than she'd intended it. Why on earth would you want to? Hyacinth shrugged. Curiosity? I'd like to meet the merry rake. You've met him, Eloise pointed out. Yes, but that was ages ago, Hyacinth said with a dramatic sigh. Before I understood what a rake was. You don't understand that now, Violet said sharply. Oh, but I... You do not, Violet repeated, understand what a rake is. Very well. Hyacinth turned to her mother with a sickly, sweet smile. I don't know what a rake is. I also don't know how to dress myself or wash my own teeth. I did see Polly helping her on with her evening gown last night, Eloise murmured from the sofa. No one can get into an evening gown on her own, Hyacinth shot back. I'm leaving, Francesca announced, even though she was quite certain no one was listening to her. What are you doing? Hyacinth demanded. Francesca stopped short until she realised that Hyacinth wasn't speaking to her. Just examining your teeth? Eloise said sweetly. Girls! Violet exclaimed, although Francesca couldn't imagine that Eloise took too kindly to the generalization, being seven and twenty as she was. And indeed she didn't, but Francesca took Eloise's irritation and subsequent rejoinder as an opportunity to slip out of the room and ask a footman to call up the carriage for her. The streets were not very crowded. It was early yet, and the ton would not be heading out for parties and balls for at least another hour or two. The carriage moved swiftly through Mayfair, and in under a quarter of an hour, Francesca was climbing the front steps of Kilmartin House in St. James's. As usual, a footman opened the door before she could even lift the knocker, and she hurried inside. "'Is Kilmartin here?' she asked, realising with a small jolt of surprise that it was the first time she had referred to Michael as such. It was strange, she realised, and good, really, how naturally it had come to her lips. It was probably past time that they all grew used to the change. He was the Earl now, and he'd never be plain Mr. Sterling again. I believe so, the footman replied. He came in early this afternoon, and I was not made aware of his departure. Francesca frowned, then gave a nod of dismissal before heading up the steps. If Michael was indeed at home, he must be upstairs. If he were down in his office, the footman would have noticed his presence. She reached the second floor, then strode down the hall toward the Earl's suite, her booted feet silent on the plush Aubusson carpet. Michael, she called out softly as she approached his room. Michael? There was no response, so she moved closer to his door, which she noticed was not quite all the way closed. Michael! she called again, only slightly louder. It wouldn't do to bellow his name through the house. Besides, if he was sleeping, she didn't wish to wake him. He was probably still tired from his long journey, and had been too proud to indicate as such when Violet had invited him to supper.
Still nothing. So she pushed the door open a few additional inches. Michael? She heard something. A rustle, maybe. Maybe a groan. Michael? Franny! It was definitely his voice, but it wasn't like anything she'd ever heard from his lips. Michael! She rushed in to find him huddled in his bed, looking quite as sick as she'd ever seen another human being. John, of course, had never been sick. He'd merely gone to bed one evening and woken up dead, so to speak. Michael! she gasped. What is wrong with you? Oh, nothing much, he croaked. Head cold, I imagine. Francesca looked down at him with dubious eyes. His dark hair was plastered to his forehead. His skin was flushed and mottled, and the level of heat radiating from the bed quite took her breath away. Not to mention that he smelled sick. It was that awful, sweaty, slightly putrid smell, the sort that, if it had a colour, would surely be vomitous green. Francesca reached out and touched his forehead, recoiling instantly at the heat of it. This is not a head cold, she said sharply. His lips stretched into a hideous approximation of a smile. A really bad head cold? Michael Stuart Sterling! Good God, you sound like my mother. She didn't particularly feel like his mother, especially not after what had happened in the park, and it was almost a bit of a relief to see him so feeble and unattractive. It took the edge off whatever it was she'd been feeling earlier that afternoon. Michael, what is wrong with you? He shrugged, then buried himself deeper under the covers, his entire body shaking from the exertion of it. Michael! She reached out and grabbed his shoulder. None too gently, either. Don't you dare try your usual tricks on me. I know exactly how you operate. You always pretend that nothing matters, that water rolls off your back. It does roll off my back, he mumbled. Yours as well. Simple science, really. Michael! She would have smacked him if he weren't so ill. You will not attempt to minimise this. Do you understand me? I insist that you tell me right now what is wrong with you. I'll be better tomorrow, he said. Oh, right, Francesca said, with all the sarcasm she could muster, which was, in truth, quite a bit. I will, he insisted, restlessly shifting positions, every movement punctuated with a groan. I'll be fine for tomorrow. Something about the phrasing of his words struck Francesca as profoundly odd. And what about the day after that? she asked, her eyes narrowing. A harsh chuckle emerged from somewhere under the covers. Why, then I'll be sick as a dog again, of course. Michael, she said again, dread forcing her voice low. What is wrong with you? Haven't you guessed? He poked his head back out from under the sheet, and he looked so ill she wanted to cry. I have malaria. Oh, my God, Francesca breathed, actually backing up a step. Oh, my God. First time I've ever heard you blaspheme, he remarked. Probably ought to be flattered it's over me. She had no idea how he could be so flip at such a time. Michael, I... She reached out, then didn't reach out, unsure of what to do. Don't worry, he said, huddling closer into himself as his body was racked with another wave of shudders. You can't catch it from me. I can't, she blinked. I mean, of course I can't. And even if she could, that ought not have stopped her from nursing him. He was Michael. He was... Well... It seemed difficult precisely to define what he was to her, but they had an unbreakable bond, they too, and it seemed that four years and thousands of miles had done little to diminish it. It's the air, he said in a tired voice. You have to breathe the putrid air to catch it. It's why they call it malaria. If you could get it from another person, 
We lot would have infected all of England by now. She nodded at his explanation. Are you... are you... She couldn't ask it. She didn't know how. No, he said. At least they don't think so. She felt herself sag with relief, and she had to sit down. She couldn't imagine a world without him. Even while he'd been gone, she'd always known he was there, sharing the same planet with her, walking the same earth. And even in those early days following John's death, when she'd hated him for leaving her, even when she'd been so angry with him that she wanted to cry, she had taken some comfort in the knowledge that he was alive and well, and would return to her in an instant, if ever she asked it of him. He was here, he was alive, and with John gone. Well, she didn't know how anyone could expect her to lose them both. He shivered again violently. Do you need medicine? she asked, snapping to attention. Do you have medicine? Took it already, he chattered. But she had to do something. She wasn't self-hating enough to think that there had been anything she could have done to prevent John's death. Even in the worst of her grief, she hadn't gone down that road. But she had always hated that the whole thing had happened in her absence. It was, in truth, the one momentous thing John had ever done without her. And even if Michael was only sick and not dying, she was not going to allow him to suffer alone. Let me get you another blanket, she said. Without waiting for his reply, she rushed through the connecting door to her own suite and pulled the coverlet off her bed. It was rose pink and would most likely offend his masculine sensibilities once he reached a state of sensibility, but that, she decided, was his problem. When she returned to his room, he was so still she thought he'd fallen asleep, but he managed to rouse himself enough to say thank you as she tucked the blanket over him. What else can I do? she asked, pulling a wooden chair to the side of his bed and sitting down. Nothing. There must be something, she insisted. Surely we're not meant to merely wait this out. We are meant, he said weakly, to merely wait this out. I can't believe that's true. He opened one eye. Do you mean to challenge the entire medical establishment? She ground her teeth together and hunched over in her chair. Are you certain you don't need more medicine? He shook his head, then moaned at the exertion of it. Not for another few hours. Where is it? she asked. If the only thing she could truly do was to locate the medication and be ready to dispense it, then by God, she would at least do that. He moved his head slightly to the left. Francesca followed the motion toward a small table across the room, where a medicinal bottle sat atop a folded newspaper. She immediately rose and retrieved it, reading the label as she walked back to her chair. Quinine she murmured. I've heard of that. Miracle medicine, Michael said. Or so they say. Francesca looked at him dubiously. Just look at me, he said with a lopsided and feeble grin. Proof positive. She inspected the bottle again, watching the powder shift as she tilted it. I remain unconvinced. One of his shoulders attempted to move in a blithe gesture. I'm not dead. That's not funny. No, it's the only funny thing, he corrected. We've got to take our laughter where we can. Just think, if I died, the title would go to... Oh, how does Janet always put it? That awful Debenham side of the family. They finished together, and Francesca couldn't believe it, but she actually smiled. He could always make her smile. She reached out and took his hand. We will get through this, she said. He nodded, and then he closed his eyes. But just when she thought he was asleep, he whispered, It's better with you here. 
The next morning, Michael was feeling somewhat refreshed, and if not quite his usual self, then at least a damn sight better than he'd been the night before. Francesca, he was horrified to realise, was still in the wooden chair at his bedside, her head tilted drunkenly to the side. She looked uncomfortable, in every way a body could look uncomfortable, from the way she was perched in the chair to the awkward angle of her neck and the strange spiral twist of her torso. But she was asleep, snoring even, which she found rather endearing. He'd never pictured her snoring, and sad to say, he had imagined her asleep more times than he cared to count. He supposed it had been too much to hope that he could hide his illness from her. She was far too perceptive, and certainly far too nosy, and even though he would have preferred that she didn't worry over him, the truth was he'd been comforted by her presence the night before. He shouldn't have been, or at least he shouldn't have allowed himself to be, but he just couldn't help it. He heard her stir, and rolled to his side to get a better look. He had never seen her wake up, he realised. He wasn't certain why he found that so strange. It wasn't as if he'd been privy to many of her private moments before. Maybe it was because in all of his daydreams, in all of his fantasies, he'd never quite pictured this. The low rumbling from deep in her throat as she shifted position. The small sigh of sound when she yawned, or even the delicate ballet of her eyelids as they fluttered open. She was beautiful. He'd known that, of course, had known that for years, but never before had he felt it quite so profoundly, quite so deeply in his bones. It wasn't her hair, that rich, lush wave of chestnut, that he was rarely so privileged as to see down, and it wasn't even her eyes, so radiantly blue that men had been moved to write poetry. Much, Michael recalled, to John's everlasting amusement. It wasn't even in the shape of her face or the structure of her bones. If that were the case, he'd have been obsessed with the loveliness of all the Bridgerton girls. Such peas in a pod they were, at least on the outside. It was something in the way she moved, something in the way she breathed, something in the way she merely was, and he didn't think he was ever going to get over it. Michael, she murmured, rubbing the sleep from her eyes. Good morning, he said, hoping she'd mistake the roughness in his voice for exhaustion. You look better. I feel better. She swallowed and paused before she said, You're used to this. He nodded. I wouldn't go so far as to say that I don't mind the illness, but yes, I'm used to it. I know what to do. How long will this continue? It's hard to say. I'll get fevers every other day until I just stop. A week in total, maybe two. Three if I'm fiendishly unlucky. And then what? He shrugged. Then I wait and hope it never happens again. It can do that? She sat up straight. Just never come back. It's a strange, fickle disease. Her eyes narrowed. Don't say it's like a woman. Hadn't even occurred to me until you brought it up. Her lips tightened slightly, then relaxed as she asked. How long has it been since your last? She blinked. What do you call them? He shrugged. I call them attacks. Certainly feels like one. And it's been six months. Well, that's good. She caught her lower lip between her teeth. Isn't it? Considering it had only been three before that, yes, I think so. How often has this happened? This is the third time. All in all, it's not too bad compared with what I've seen. Am I meant to take solace in that? I do, he said bluntly. Model of Christian virtue that I am. She reached out abruptly and touched his forehead. You're much cooler, she remarked. Yes, I will be. It's a remarkably consistent disease. Well, at least when you're in the midst of it. 
It would be nice if I knew when I might expect an onset. And you'll really have another fever in a day's time? Just like that? Just like that, he confirmed. She seemed to consider that for a few moments, then said, You won't be able to hide this from your family, of course. He actually tried to sit up. For God's sake, Francesca, don't tell my mother and— They're expected any day now, she cut in. When I left Scotland, they said they would only be a week behind me. And knowing Janet, that really means only three days. Do you truly expect them not to notice that you're rather conveniently— Inconveniently, he cut in acerbically. Whichever, she said sharply. Do you really think they won't notice that you're sick as death every other day? For heaven's sake, Michael, do credit them with a bit of intelligence. Very well, he said, slumping back against the pillows. But no one else. I have no wish to become the freak of London. You're hardly the first person to be stricken with malaria. I don't want anyone's pity, he bit off. Most especially yours. She drew back as if struck. And of course he felt like an ass. Forgive me, he said. That came out wrong. She glared at him. I don't want your pity, he said repentantly, but your care and your good wishes are most welcome. Her eyes didn't meet his, but he could tell that she was trying to decide if she believed him. I mean it, he said, and he didn't have the energy to try to cover the exhaustion in his voice. I am glad you were here. I have been through this before. She looked over sharply, as if she were asking a question. But for the life of him, he didn't know what. I have been through this before, he said again, and this time was different, better, easier. He let out a long breath, relieved to have found the correct word. Easier. It was easier. Oh. She shifted in her chair. I'm glad. He glanced over at the windows. They were covered with heavy drapes, but he could see glimmers of sunlight peeking in around the sides. Won't your mother be worried about you? Oh, no! Francesca yelped, jumping to her feet so quickly that her hand slammed into the bedside table. Ow, ow, ow! Are you all right? Michael inquired politely, since it was quite clear she'd done herself no real harm. Oh! She was shaking her hand out trying to stem the pain. I'd forgotten all about my mother. She was expecting me back last night. Didn't you send her a note? I did, she said. I told her you were ill, but she wrote back and said she would stop by in the morning to offer her assistance. What time is it? Do you have a clock? Of course you have a clock. She turned frantically to the small mantel clock over the fireplace. It had been John's room. It still was John's room, in so many ways. Of course she'd know where the clock was. Oh, it's only eight, she said with a relieved sigh. Mother never rises before nine, unless there is an emergency, and hopefully she won't count this as one. I tried not to sound too panicked in my note. Knowing Francesca, it would have been worded with all the cool-headed calmness she was known for. Michael smiled. She'd probably lied and said she'd hired a nurse. There's no need to panic, he said. She turned to him with agitated eyes. You said you didn't want anyone to know you had malaria. His lips parted. He had never dreamed that she would hold his wishes quite so close to her heart. You would keep this from your mother? He asked softly. Of course. It is your decision to tell her, not mine. It was really quite touching. Rather tender, even. I think you're insane, she added sharply. Well, maybe tender wasn't quite the right word. But I will honour your wishes. She planted her hands on her hips and regarded him with what could only be described as vexation. How could you even think I would do otherwise? I have no idea he murmured. Really, Michael, she grumbled, 
I do not know what is wrong with you. Swampy air, he tried to joke. She shot him a look, capitalised. I'm going back to my mother's, she said, pulling on her short grey boots. If I don't, you can be sure she will show up here with the entire faculty of the Royal College of Physicians in tow. He lifted a brow. Is that what she did whenever you took ill? She let out a little sound that was half snort, half grunt, and all irritation. I will be back soon. Don't go anywhere. He lifted his hands, gesturing somewhat sarcastically to the sickbed. Well, I wouldn't put it past you, she muttered. Your faith in my superhuman strength is touching. She paused at the door. I swear, Michael, you make the most annoying, deathly ill patient I have ever met. I live to entertain you, he called out as she was walking down the hall, and he was quite certain that if she'd had something to throw at the door, she would have done so with great vigour. He settled back down against his pillows and smiled. He might make an annoying patient, but she was a crotchety nurse, which was just fine with him. Yeah.